Hello, people. How are you? Good, amazing. Just posting to my social media as usual. Oh, of course, of course. You have to keep up with that. <laughs> I like the uh, mood lighting here. You know what yeah. this is? Is this so you can't see how messy my room is? Because it's just <laughs> disgusting in here. Can, can I, you notice? I, I had that to cover up. No, ma <laughs> no matter how Hiroko's messy room is that we cannot see, you can always see the Akira poster in the background for the... You know, the Japanese it's a good focal thing. piece, oh, and you don't see no, all these like. Good. I'm, I'm giving you props for it. Actually, I'm giving you. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Akira is the classic. What keyword is that one, though? Which Your what? The, the keyword you have on. Is it a keyboard? I don't have my glasses on. Is that a keyboard actually there? No, that's some like, action figures next to it. Oh, on, on your left. Awesome. No, <laughs> let me a, let me introduce a, this. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> let me introduce everybody who is here tonight. Uh, Hiroko is joining us here from Chicago. What's up, Hiroko? Hey, oh, everybody. and people are dropping into the chat. I see. Uh, hello, everybody who is uh, joining us. We're actually a bit late today because uh, we were watching the stream um, of the, oh. the Osgood artist stream uh, on the side. You know, just taking a peek at how it looked, and it looked amazing. I think you, um, you did such an amazing job. I'm so impressed. It's so well, great. it's the. It, I think the 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 lighting guys and um, the camera people did an amazing job too. You know, they made it look really, really nice. Uh, but anyway, we're here now. Uh, so Hiroko, welcome to Nob Twillers. Good to see you back. I'm so happy to be back. Thanks for having me. <laughs> what are you up to? Uh just kind of uh, chilling. Been uh, kind of back on the road, uh, working on some stuff. Actually, playing uh, with Sophia this Saturday. We've got a show together, yeah. so pretty excited about that. Oh, nice! Uh, got to hang out with uh, Luis uh, last month. So just slowly, kind of reconnecting with the world. Hopefully, I'll see you in a couple months, and uh, yeah, just uh, coming hopefully back alive in the in the right way. So awesome! Yeah, hopefully that would be great. Are you uh, headed to Amsterdam, Hero? Is AD even happening this year, or how's that? We're gonna make it happen. We're gonna make it yes. happen. We're kind of, we're fo we're focusing the positive energy that way. Yeah, <laughs> fingers crossed. Awesome. Uh, let us also say hi to uh, Louise joining us from Berlin. What's hey up, man? It's been a long time. Ah, oh, fuck! It's been what five years, maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been ages. Yeah. yeah. Actually, How are you? it was. We were we saw each other last at a festival, in the out or was it the burger? I'm not sure, but yeah, it was five years ago. I've been good. I can't complain. I mean, I'm here, so um, getting back Hanging into on. music, back in Berlin, and I'm trying to finish the album I'm working on with Mo. So yeah, can't really complain. So yeah, yeah, the belief, the belief, the, the belief, the fact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah you gotta you gotta tell us about that because uh, you've been mostly working on on that stuff uh, remotely, right? Uh. Well, we actually no. We just did the most of it to like an eighty percent of the album, and the remaining parts were just diffused through the pandemic because everything was diffused through the pandemic. So now that we're trying to finish it, some of it is still at a distance, but uh, most of it is done. We just have to do the mix down and the final version of the track and that kind of shit, and then structure it. But yeah, it's that last weird eighty percent between technical and finishing the last three tracks kind of thing. So yeah, it's it's. Uh, so have you been able happening. to meet? Have you been able to meet each other to uh, to work on it uh, recently? Yeah, after the so the pandemic happened, and I went to Mexico at the beginning of the year to check up on my parents, which I hadn't seen for a good chunk, and because they're older and stuff. So on the way back, I spent uh, like ten days in LA. We did a couple of shows together. We worked in the studio. So yeah, I mean, we met again. And But actually, out of that meeting, uh, we're still working on the stuff that was about to be finished. So, I mean, that wasn't particularly the push. But yeah, we hung up. We hung out and um, saw his kid. He's It's four and a half now. And it's, so yeah, it was good to see people again, no matter what. So then I just got back. So I, I hope we can finish it within the next two months. I'm really looking forward to that album, man. I, I really like the stuff you do together with uh, with uh, Mo. Yeah, thank you. That live show you did at um, 
Uh, atonal. Atonal, yeah, that was absolutely epic. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a, uh, it was a uh, fortunate in many senses. As in, I'm actually equally happy we got it. You know, as in, recorded and uh, the whole thing. Yeah, yeah nice. Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, well, maybe we'll just revisit that during the chat. But maybe first introduce uh, Sophia joining us from Philly, right? Philly. Yep, that's you are? right. It's nice to see you again, Yoko. Nice yeah, to nice to see you here. too. Thank you for having me again. Um, I'm really missing everybody, so it's nice that we have these kind of opportunities to um, meet up to some extent. Awesome. Uh, what have What have you been up to? Honestly, I've uh, just like really been detached from like a lot of like you know a lot of like the stuff I guess I was busy with before but it's been nice like very transitional for me um just like making music but not ha haven't really been doing like electronic stuff just on different projects um moved and like made really my permanent home so just kind of like taking care of my mental headspace outside of music in ways um or like different aspects of music so it's been kind of refreshing you know but it's exciting as well to like look forward to all the um you know all the things coming back slowly but surely i guess that's cool i mean you the last time i spoke to you you were working on some installation stuff and some av stuff how how is yeah, that been going yeah um it's going well um we made some like adjustments to it for uh the museum of modern electronic music i think that's what you're the one in frankfurt um that's been going well I also got the chance to do like um, to like film score this like car commercial, which is really nice. So hopefully that comes out soon. Amazing. Um, and I'm doing like some sync work for like um, these like labels out in Japan. It's mainly like pop and like hip hop clients, but it's been really nice again just to like get to work on different things and kind of like expand my palette a little bit, you know. Um, also, because I don't think my neighbors here in this new spot like really want to hear like. <laughs> four by four drums all the time. So I'm kind of trying to like ease their ease into being a new neighbor uh, instead of just like banging it out all the time. So um, yeah, how, how have you been, Jürgen? I'm good. I mean, we've been really busy um, since the last time I've spoken to you, like with we've done all these remote jams, you know, and uh, uh, you know, the live shows we've done here. And um, yeah, we're taking a break from that, uh, kind of refining the the concept, and and you know maybe come back with uh, another or better version at some point. Uh, but right now, I'm 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 focusing on my own stuff, to be honest. You know, like uh, building setups, getting my here my head around some some uh, some gear I haven't used for a while, and um, yeah, yeah, just uh, enjoying myself in the studio. What kind of uh, what were the biggest like adjustments or new updates that you are um, currently like? with well I mean I've um, I'm working with um, I, I mean I, I usually build very really small setups you know like uh, consisting of just a few pieces of gear and right now I'm it's it's actually right in front of me it, I'm using the circle on with um, one rack of modular stuff um, you know kind of uh, taking care of the circle is kind of doing the sequencing mostly but uh you know it's sort of you know, like drummy and fme stuff you know so yeah. yeah i'm kind of mixing it up see what it see what it does you know i've got that this this uh cv out breakout box for for the circle on so i can kind of um program stuff on the on the modular but it's, it's always like a little regarding yeah, the go, circle go. One because we were talking about that sequencer like two episodes or three episodes ago in the misery index oh it comes up all the time <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah circle and shout out <laughs> yeah exactly but but the question was uh is it everything it seems to be well in, is it that intuitive is it that uh easier is it like it, what is the upside of, of the actual machine well, I mean, yes, For if you want it to be your sort of bread and butter sequencer, it's really good at that, you know, so you can do very, um, it's very, very quick, quick to program and there's a lot of stuff you can, uh, you can get done very quickly. But if you want to go uh -huh. deeper and, and more complex and more elaborate, uh, that's possible to too. Oh, yeah. okay, it's possible too, okay. Yeah, so it's it's quite easy once you once you get the um, the main kind of architecture um, in your head, you know how uh, where everything is and how everything works. You know what the structure is of the 
of the machine. Of the interface. Yeah. yeah, then it's then it's actually quite easy to to work with. But there's so many uh, sub menus and 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 features that uh, you know that can do it, it takes really a while. really. Yeah, and I mean, it's you know, it's just basically endless. If if there is any, I mean, to, you know, the funny thing is, uh, yesterday I had a, a little chat with um, uh, one of our Discord uh, regulars, Split, Split Radix. He's like the, the he's this guy who does the uh, really, really, really well explaining uh, YouTube videos about the circle on his uh, on his YouTube channel. Uh -huh. And there was one thing I wanted to make it do, and I couldn't find out how. And I asked him, and it, apparently it was one of the things, <laughs> you know, the only thing I ran into right now, until now, uh, that it can cannot do. <laughs> but oh, okay. that's, what is that's it? pretty much the only thing I found so far. Everything else is pretty it? much what possible. What was it that it couldn't do? Well, I'm I'm right now I'm I'm using um, um, sequence uh, tracks which all have different step lengths, which is uh -huh. quite possible. But if you want to, um, if you want to use scenes, which are basically collection of tracks and mutes and settings uh, per uh -huh. track, um, and if if you change the scene, the it switches like a, it sort of fades into as in the, the controller changes like abruptly. Well, the thing is, the, the thing I wanted to make it do was that, you know, to change scenes and have the the odd stepped sequences just continue rather than re being reset to step one. Oh, because they're, they're odd numbered, so they're looping yeah. at different rates. Yeah, there's this thing in, in the circle on called G-bar, and that's basically like a global bar thing. Mm -hmm. and, and whatever you do in a scene sticks to the global bar, and if the global bar is not finished... Uh, or when the global bar finishes, it basically go back goes back to step one. So if you uh -huh. have like uh, many different, you know, I had one with uh, I had three uh, one track with three step sequence, one with five, one with seven, and you know, like uh, there was a bunch more. Like and if, you, if yeah, yeah, but if if you, I mean, there is there is a number eventually where you, that you can find where that will kind of bring them all together. <laughs> but yeah, in but this the, case. Yeah, but it is really, really long. Yeah, and, yeah, and it uh, was too long, you know, longer than the the circle was capable of doing. So I was finding, oh. trying to find a way to. Anyway, long story short. Um, and it's still not it's, capable of doing it. That was one thing, but th there might be, there might still be a way. I don't know, but um, um, I can, I can certainly work around it. You know, I no, don't necessarily have to use the scenes. I was just like, uh, okay, if I can put this in scenes, I can toggle between the scenes quickly just to get an arrangement going and stuff without resetting anyway it. okay i get it there <laughs> yeah but it's pretty much it's pretty much capable of doing anything you want uh, and and more you know there's like a lot of tricks too to get things that you would never come up to, come up with if you were playing on a keyboard or uh with uh, other step step sequencers you know there's you know you can generate almost generate sequences with all the tricks that it has on board you know you can get really complicated things very very quickly the, the, so. the, the entry point on that thing i, I yeah, sat down with it for maybe like an hour oh I but just, that's not I enough i couldn't get it I no no you have it. to spend yeah. a week you I mean, have to spend a week at least yeah. two grand and a half also that entry point is pretty steep yeah but i mean it it i it mean i'm really I was cool. with Hiroko. That, yeah. it's, it's a prime machine for us i mean it's it is it is that's that was a question if it's really worth the, the as with most other gear it requires commitment. <laughs> yeah, uh, but uh, this, also, that, I mean, this that one in particular, though, it was really like, it's rare that I'll sit down with something and stare at it and be like, I have no idea what anything <laughs> is going on on this box. I mean, th that's that's the interesting thing of it because you assume it has to do all this shit sequencers do as a minimum, right? So that's already complex or simple enough, depending on what you're thinking of. But the right. fact that it's reduced to this size. My the question has to be: How good is the interface for people to uh, to flow with it so so free as in so effectively? Because it is limited and it's a limited space. So the layout and the logic of flick, flip, flipping pages and all the, the assignment of controllers are adapted to whatever knobs you have, and it's so effective. Then it's a fucking interface engineering fucking miracle. I mean, that's, I mean, yeah, that's, people swear by that box. So yeah, that's, 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 that's it's me. It's me. It's not the box. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's a bit old school. You know, it it reminds you of uh, working with trackers a little bit and um, the MMT8 with from with releases. like yeah yeah it's it it you know it requires some some. Um, 
dedication. You have to sit behind it and kind of, you know, um, spend time on it, and then it, it'll pay off. You know, it's um, it's it's a really, really. I mean, I I'm hooked. You know, it's a totally. Does um, anybody find like limitations help you get better results than just like this limitless? Do whatever the fuck well, you want. It is the focus, man. It is is like you know, if if you're in in a, in a door, you know, you can pretty much um, do, do anything. anything. But um, at the same time, your your options are limitless, and and sometimes you, you know, if you get like some, if you don't get what you want instantly or not soon enough, uh, you know, the risk you is can that spend you hours are trying to, yeah, yeah to right. fix it or to to look for things that are not particularly creative, but are you know just available just to fix your problem or to you know postpone your 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 decision. You're or dealing with the issue. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah and and this. This thing makes you kind of decide and and commit, and I think I think that's yeah. a, that's a really big that's thing. In, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Because I remember when I switched from hardware to computers back in the before, probably I don't want to mention how long ago it was, but a long time ago, and <laughs> and and nineteen uh, twenties. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that computer. So. Um, so you had all the plugins available and all the shit, and it just became um, like having all the gear in the world, and then you're just looking at it. You cannot decide how to do one step because all the options are still not being taken. So it's, it becomes like a self-defeating positive thing, you know? Yeah, absolutely. To your point, um, recently here in Louis, I had like a, like through a mutual friend, had the opportunity to basically get like a free... Uh, mixing console like the Sony Oxford OXF oh, wow. R3, which is like a legendary piece. Obviously, there was like 50 of them ever made, nice. and it's this incredible piece. Um, and then when I went to actually go and like you know get the manual and like basically go through this guy's notes, like of you know programming it and like it's in pretty good shape still. But then when you think about like the ramp up that's going to be needed to like one learn how to literally program. Um, this massive piece that you're going to have, um, you know, take up that much space, which are all things that you wouldn't really complain about when you're getting gifted, like an incredible piece. But then you take into consideration that it's like not being made anymore. So servicing on that is going to be like nearly impossible because there's not many like engineers that can like, if something goes wrong, there's not that many pieces that are being sold. Or you just take the Sonics plugins, which are literally a direct emulation of like the OXF R3. So it's like, you come to this like point sometimes where it's like, how efficient is this? How, you know, but um, like, of course it doesn't apply to like all pieces, but like, like what Yogan was saying about like, you know, kind of keeping things compact and like, you know, like it's obviously incredible sometimes to just have like all this like toys around you. But then like that piece, like I was looking, <laughs> I mean, that manual would probably take me like a year at least. And that's if I was like diligent about it, you know, I mean, it's like, so you're it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Okay. Um, well, I'm it? still like on the fence about grabbing it. I have, yeah. like, you know, I could, I, w I would make space for like an incredible piece, but it's more about like how much of it am I going to be using, you know, or is it just like for show, just to say that like, wow, I have this amazing piece, but like, and then what? Impress, what are you I mean, doing with it? That's impress cool your clients. Too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's a good background. Yeah, I like, like the idea of like keeping things compact and like revisiting like older. Um, like things that felt like naturally like a, like an inclination for you and if that works like it's like it's a really nice um like honestly it's such a simple like analogy because obviously it's just like such a simple piece to compare to like some of the pieces that we're talking about but like this tra i bought that like years ago my dad bought it for me as a gift when i was first starting out and it was a really easy you know primary instinct right but it's like depending on how well and how quickly you can use it it can almost be more effective than some of like, like, like my electron, like I'm still learning it, you know, after like two years of having it, it's like, the, it's like that thing, to, it's like that also takes so long, you know, so it's like sometimes like the sort of immediate. Yeah, yeah even, even, go ahead. Oh, uh, even when you, like the, the TR8S, Louise, <laughs> even when the TR8S came out, I was like, I'm going to sell the TR8, right? Like Roland, Roland yeah. hooked me up with the TR8S, but it's like, the the limitations of the TR8 and just that it just does this thing right it does the 808 yeah. and that and the, the crappy 707 samples that you have to pay a hundred dollars for but like <laughs> it's just it does this thing 
it only does this thing, and I kept going back to the TR8 instead of the TR8S because it just it's just that much more familiar, and you kind of just know exactly what it's going to do. Well, yeah. that goes back to the thing about the interface of the Circlon because it really has to be a very well thought out, intuitive interface for it to like uh, replace existing gear people are familiar with, and be more effective as a piece you can flow with because that's the whole trick about the TR line or the Roland line because people that didn't know how to make music or were just getting into it, it, it provided easy access to the results and thus it became the classic uh, thing yes. that they became. That's it. Yeah, I think I think with this with the Circlon though, it 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 can be your your uh, quick um, machine to get your sort of uh, um, Ideas. you know bread and butter yeah. patterns going, but it can also be a thing to really dive into and to explore, um, cool. and and you know uh, you can have to come up with things that you cannot imagine yourself, you know. Yeah, so like, it's, like it's, how, it has how, this really how to think up odd couple old numbered patterns into one thing and yeah i mean that's that becomes a creative solution to the to well the, th the thing is i i like gear which which um um which forces me to come up with an idea first rather than um just noodling around until you hit something you know yeah, i yeah. sometimes like I, I sometimes like the process of um you know stumbling upon ideas but um you know it's, yeah the, the the circle is a machine that kind of uh forces you to to work to work uh, and and get you know to get your idea out of it, and yeah. uh, so yeah, again, it requires more commitment and and it and it makes it keeps you focused. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah, good I don't know. It's just a it's a weird relationship, you know. It's it's not like uh, it's an instrument. You know, you turn yeah, it on. Yeah, you, you, it's not like you turn it on and something amazing happens. You really have to think about it and get you get the system worked out in your head. You know what what you want to do and then. Um, I don't know. It's it's. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, that, it's, it's, that is also a good point that you're signaling to because a lot of the times when you're fucking around with like techno, you're trying to see what happens through the through the exercise of fucking with gear, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that you have to restructure it to begin with forces you to stop fucking around because now you have to now you have a clear idea. So in itself is the solution in a way, you know. Yeah, and because because an operation, uh, like if like like say if if you want to if you're building something and you think okay this is what I what I want to happen uh, to make happen next you know uh, you have to um, you know it, it requires some work to get it to do that and you know in a door you can just copy and paste or you know just stick something behind it and and mute some things and there you are but in in the circle and it takes a bit more thinking and a bit more. Uh, uh, planning, you know, and and so, um, you know, you, you you're not like in this zone where you were just fucking around. You're just really making a decision and committing to it, which is something yeah, that yeah. helps getting things done. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. That's cool. That's really cool. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. not an easy thing. That's why I mean we've been talking about the same thing for the whatever time we've been talking. But that's, <laughs> uh, I'm curious about it because that is exactly the question how how does it push people forward but yeah that's it you, it forces people to commit at the end yeah you have a session with it and then and you plan time with it you know you commit and that's that's the that's the powerful thing i think yeah, that's cool. anyway yeah. you can when so, you've been uh, reconfiguring your setup do you find yourself like gravitating to like older pieces that you used before and like because sometimes like going back to like you know the point of what we we're just talking about it's like you know, things that you dismiss because you felt like you, you reached the peak of it, then you actually realize like that simplicity of that piece was actually like a really nice and like most impactful effect, you know? I find that a lot with like, even like in mixing, like sometimes when I get too carried away in it, I realize that just like using like simple approaches kind of works better, <laughs> better you know? Mm -hmm. um, but it's like kind of like coming back like full circle sometimes. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I do revisit uh, most most gear, you know, and and some some of it has been, uh, you know, on the shelf for for a year or maybe more. And then when I get back to it, um, it's going to be uh, hooked up in a different way and part of a different setup. So it's going to be it's going to act differently anyway, you know. Like, um, but the. The, the thing is, you know, um, I, I think of setups in advance, you know, so I, I kind of plan them out 
and and then I, you know, connect everything together because I have this idea what I want to uh, achieve with it, you know, uh, and I kind of pick the instruments to, um, t you know, that I think could do the job, kind of, and how they are connected, how they are routed, what kind of, you know, how the signal flow goes, what the chain is is going to be, uh, and then I I just um, you know start programming the whole thing and see what happens, you know. Um, but uh, you know, I'm I'm you know because it it takes some time to put this together and to to plan this out. Um, it also makes you again focused on getting it done with just that set of stuff that you've chosen, you know. And and um, yeah, and, and you know, in a computer, it's always very difficult, very easy to be honest to uh, to res you know to kind of get sidetracked or to try something else very quickly. Yeah. Um, so it's it just fun, you know. Just to, yeah, it's just like you know, I, you, I I put a thing together, a setup together, and then I just explore it and you know see what the range is and um, yeah, just make it happen with just that stuff. And um, yeah, sometimes uh, it requires some extra work and tuning and creativity to get something out of it because it's it is limited, of course. But it's um, yeah, but it it also kind of uh, makes you work harder, or uh, yeah, <laughs> no, know, but, uh, it's more productive because you have an objective preset. That's that, that's what I'm saying. Is and the, mm -hmm. the difference becomes, in my opinion, is to have to think what you want to do. Because if you're just gonna turn on the computer and just bounce, you can you don't even know what it is you're looking for. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So the the whole men the whole mindset makes a makes a difference in itself. So yeah, I think it's pretty significant. I mean, yeah. it happens to me all the time after. So many years, I still open the. Sometimes it's like, well, it's just like. Oh, there's the first comment uh, about the Akira poster, uh, uh, Yuruko. Oh, recognize. <laughs> <laughs> That's my boyfriend. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're yeah, big. Uh, we're big Akira fans. <laughs> so, do you have any any strategies to uh, to not get sidetracked uh, yourself, then, Luis? Oh, definitely no. I have every no. strategy to get sidetracked <laughs> to the point that I wasn't able to finish some of the belief defect stuff because I was listening to the news behind the music. I had to play the music to focus on something to to keep me there. So that's how uh, that's how unable to focus I was. Now it's changed finally, but but yeah, the pandemic was a really trip for that whole thing of why do I have to do this if there's no real or clear results to be had you know what i mean so it was it was really just a mind uh it had it, it made me rethink the whole reason of making music again which was the whole point right so mm. yeah, in a way it was a good thing so i'm still getting back to it which is this idea uh, or this question i asked you because so is, the, is that um uh, uh you okay. said this this Check. Oh, I think you're crapping out now. <laughs> Luis is turning into a robot. Exactly. Craft work style. <laughs> oh man, that reminds me of when we did the stream when I was in Georgia. <laughs> and it was like, we were, and then a later stream we were joking about it and then it cut out again as we were joking about it. So it was like, <laughs> uh, oh no, we're losing her. <laughs> and she's gone. <laughs> is it back? So, yeah, you're back. Uh, Normal? Yeah, we can hear you, yeah. Berlin Internet. We're not back to normal. Okay, good, good. Okay, so what was the question? Berlin. Internet. No, you you were talking you were talking about the um, um, making music and and um, you know sort of kind of uh, picking Finding it the up. the purpose of the yeah yeah. Uh, well, well, uh, it's I don't know. It's been very trippy. It's more like a like a therapy session. So I'm not gonna go there. But but at the end was. Um, <laughs> Feel, being able to feel the music again, so that kind of just made me connected to the process uh, in a significant way, and then that alone has, makes me have to structure everything because I, if I if I'm linked to the thing I'm working, then I wanted to have it done. So it was more on that side. Well, that's in, that's interesting. So so yeah, you're kind of saying that without being you know being on the road and playing out, you kind of. Uh, uh, Lost the, the, the incentive. Yeah, you, yeah, really. Is is that true? I mean, I mean it, I, it, it, that's yeah. That was. It's it isn't. It isn't. That's my point. But when it happened, oh, okay. that that uh, that I had to think of. Well, I'm not doing it. I mean, am I doing it for money? Because there's better ways to do to make money. You know, <laughs> as in 
I mean, it's not this way. So, um, so I had to re like we understand everything, which was the whole process. And in a sense, yes, it's not because of lack of purpose, but but uh, I have to want it. So that whole year and a half of of, uh, of uh, the pandemic thing was to relearn what was the whole point of making music to begin with. So I finally got it back. So yeah, it was uh, it was part of the thing. Okay. So, do you need um, to be gigging uh, Iroko to be able to be creative in the studio? You know, for me, they're they're completely opposite things. You know, uh, gigging. Uh, you know, I'm kind of from the rave scene, so I'm, I'm very much still like a party DJ, right? I play I play music uh, in 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 events to make people dance, right? And and with this very kind of singular purpose and. Um, production for me is a little bit more of kind of an introverted uh, alone time thing. So um, I think kind of similar to Luis seeing, you know, no, no matter what, if you're, if you're going to have this end product, which is going to be a track, right? And I think the, the, the point of having a release during a time that maybe no one's going to hear it or it's not going to get played or it's use of being a dance floor kind of tool or whatever you might think it is, if that's not there, I think that gets tougher, right? So yeah. um, a lot of a lot of lockdown and 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 and, and using that time yeah. is about building ideas and not necessarily finishing tracks, right? So let's get these hundred loops going that really go nowhere, but I think maybe have some potential. And let's not get it to the point that it's a finished track right now, because I don't have that vision. I don't necessarily, I don't know where the sound is going, but I think, you know, this is also my entertainment. So going and, and working on music and jamming, this is what I did for fun during lockdown, right? So uh, other forms of entertainment weren't there. So it was lots of video games and uh, lots of kind of just jamming. Sometimes they were recorded, sometimes they weren't. So, um, so you're yeah. telling us you have like hundreds of uh, unfinished uh, Eurogo loops sitting on your computer. Yeah, and they're Keep, all keeping they're, it for, I, to yourself. Not ninety percent of them are pretty much unlistenable, but um, okay. maybe maybe they can be worked into something, you know. Mm. But the, don't you? Do, oh, sorry, go Sophia. Go. No, go ahead, please. Yeah, I, I was yeah, wondering yeah, because the thing the thing I noticed that, with uh, myself and a lot of other yeah, people please. is that the stuff that you. Um, uh, that you weren't really doing because, uh, but, but uh, you know, coming to the <laughs> oh, you're freezing again, Luis. Uh, let's uh, let's so see when great. he comes back. I I, I mean I, I was I was uh, referring to the the sort of the the side projects that everybody's been picking up, you know, like. Um, uh, things that um, so, they always wanted oh, no, to do and never the, had a time for doing. Freezing. Oh man! <laughs> feels like it's like it's like watching myself again. It's like now it's just yeah, like yeah. Okay. on the other side. This is a good like, still. That was happening to me. Yeah, that was the same thing. Luis's frozen face. Luis. I was like relentlessly yeah. kept trying to, and it was only making it worse. And I was doing good. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> yep. We'll continue without. Mr. Flo. Uh, Sometimes turning the um, in. Uh, maybe he's he's finding a cable now. <laughs> no, I was I was just talking about the things that um, you know I see many people do you know with more time in the studio because there's no uh, there's less gigs and stuff. Um, you know, people have been kind of um, you know picking up things that they've 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 been planning to do but never got around to doing. You know, like more sort of. Um, you know, less dance floor oriented music or um, just having fun in the studio kind of projects, you know? Um, yeah, so. I think it, and a lot of it's also been like, I, I took the chance, I took the time to focus on more remixes and collaborations because then there was some kind of due date and someone else there that had, you know, someone poking you a little bit being like, where is this thing I need it done? Or um, yeah. just because for my own stuff, there just didn't really seem to be a due date. There didn't seem to be necessarily a thing to turn in. So um, kept kept active by collaborating with people and just doing remixes. 
So it was done when it was done, right? I had to turn it in by a certain date, and that, that kind of worked out well for me. Two questions. Am I back? Yes, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fluid. Okay. All good. Okay, thank you. So the second point was, uh, yeah, that was part of the problem with specifically, I think, with dance music, because it has a functional aspect to it, because it's dance music. So if it's product. the world can, yeah. Yeah, exactly, it has, it, it, I mean, besides the artistic side of it or the creative side of it, it has to for, serve a purpose, which is DJs and all this stuff, right? So when that incentive structure disappeared, where it's also linked to, you know, jobs and all this shit, then it's, then it made it weirder because, you know, the personal stuff becomes personal and you can do it for other reasons. But the functional side that uh, also helps people work through techno, as in the work side of it, it wasn't there anymore. So it kind of, yeah, it was a weird rearranging of things to, to commit to it in a way. But yeah, I, I agree with Hiroko in the fact that the, the objective of the activity has to be implicit somehow. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with all the points you guys are making. And I have to say, um, like, Hiroko, what I always admired about, you know, your range is, like, purely that, like, your ability to kind of, like, navigate in and out, be it, like, people that you're playing with, performing with, or the music that you put out. I think that kind of sensibility is, like, really nice, you know, in music, because, um, at the, I mean, obviously, like, throughout COVID, there's been so many, like, waves of emotions, and as an industry, things, like, kind of coming back and whatnot, but, like, I was just having this conversation, I noticed Kai's comment pop up, and, uh, and we're about to put out his record, actually, um, he was actually the guy that got, like, he won, like, the remix competition for David, so I found oh, out nice. that about his music, and we were having yeah, this conversation yesterday, yeah. yeah, about, like, you know, as a label, how we want to distribute his music, how, what kind of, press do we want around it right publicity and it was interesting because like my like my first thought was like listen like coming off of covid there's two ways you could go right there's one is like going back to what you were doing before or this time has allowed you to reshape come you know reconfigure try different things and i was like you know yes of course traditionally we have and could do just like a press campaign right a very generic like promo email or you could take a more organic approach, you know, that might seep in deeper, especially coming off of COVID when people want to feel like a more honest sort of like relationship with the music, right? So instead of just stuffing the music down somebody's throat, you know, I could just pass it along to people that I think would even be interested in, not just to everyone, because of course, naturally, we all have different tastes, right? Like everybody likes yeah. different things. So what is the point of that person even receiving that promo email if it's a forced feedback, forced reaction, or it's like, you know, it's just like the way we're digesting it and like, and like, and then coming, like reworking it and producing it, putting it back out there. I think like that cycle for me, at least it's really changed throughout COVID to really get more in touch with like the thing that, and the people that like, that drive all this music, right? Like not just like getting more and more lost and like, more. yeah, doing we're, we are, before. we are talking about this yesterday. Um, actually, mm. Luis and I, we're, the PR, where PR sits in this whole game and where they're going to sit in the end of all this and how as artists, like, do we keep fueling that fire and growing this beast that is PR companies and their abilities and what they do, but it's also understandable where they sit in, in the whole machine of things and, like, it's just, it's, it's a weird thing to think about, you know? Yeah. No, because Because at the end, what became or what were like uh, PR companies that would get you, like, uh, would, you, would get your music to certain critics or publishings or whatever. Now it becomes the more we depend on the shit, it becomes like a gatekeeper because we're giving them the ability to to be between the media and whatever you're trying to release. So, what was may maybe more available before when you directly sent a promo to a to a magazine or a label years ago. Uh, now it has to be done through paying for the service, which is literally they just invented a, a, a in between, and and it's sometimes questionable if it actually helps or or, or makes it worse. Yeah, I think all the steps are important because like you got to have you got to try it all right in order to understand what what works good for you. Um, right. I would say what's most effective when you're representing another artist or you're trying to get so outside of your own music, you believe in another artist, right? And you're trying to 
make sure that that music falls into the hands of people who the right people who appreciate that um so if you're just like the model of just traditionally like i feel like that might change in some ways just on a purely technical level because like the way we're consuming music is very different now and just like media in general and um, and it's been interesting to see a lot of different startups throughout COVID, like music startups that are trying different approaches to like be it streaming or um you know distribution and whatnot and like you know i feel like all in all like there's been aspects of each different company that i really enjoyed you know like for example we worked with like currents uh for a stream and like i really like the tip model that they had because it was like one where you basically share like whatever you generate if somebody donates something to arts it gets shared with whoever you support and you follow as well so that was a cool aspect and then there's like bits of like other things um that i really enjoyed but i would i'd say to your point of like as an artist like how it shapes what you're putting out you know in some ways you can say yeah it's been great that people have had the chance to experiment with different things throughout COVID but that should be a norm right like the fact but of course like but like the constructs of like you know the functionality and whatnot it's like it's been definitely like a balance that's something that I've personally been thinking about a lot like you know you should be able to put out a non you know let's say dance or by four uh record if you're just because you're touring right shouldn't really affect that so like the way we view like the sort of um, our appreciation and support for like what path artists are taking, I think, has in some ways could have changed after, or will change, maybe, hopefully, after COVID. Is, but, that, is that something that's on your mind, Sophia, when you when you're creating something? Is the is the the possible perception of 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 what you're doing already on your mind when you are in the studio? I wish it had been because sometimes I'm like if it probably was, it probably would have been more like functional, I guess, you know. Um, so like for me, it was interesting because during COVID, I noticed there was a lot of, um, you know, like ambient records coming out, let's say. But for me, I was putting out my ambient record when I was touring, which wasn't <laughs> functional or logical or smart, really. Right. In the sense, like pe if people are going out to hear you perform somewhere and they're getting like a banging techno set and then you know, you're putting out something super, you know, left field and it's got no relation to what you're playing out. It's not really smart from a sort of like that, that aspect, right? But um, to me, it feels like it's all in all, it made me better at my skill set because it helped me like develop, like separating from that. Um, I wish I had been more conscious of that when I was like putting, at least I not think... creating, but putting it out maybe, you know? But uh, you, I guess, you know, it just, Everybody has a different approach. <laughs> I, I was going to refer to that ex exactly that exercise regarding Yoka because he was uh, at one point when you we were doing the, the, the ginger stuff and like back when we were young, <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the, the relationship, it wasn't so strict for artists. I mean, you could do weird ambient stuff and, and then the more it got focused into the uh, DJ uh, business market, then it's weirder for people to switch genres or, or do like another type of music because it then everybody's upset that you broke your own brand in a way. And, mm. uh, and, and they resent you for like pushing outside the, your comfort zone, which in or, originally that was the whole point. As in, if somebody was able to do techno and then you could hear an ambient track or whatever, and then you would actually understand the overall intention of the artist that has well, that range. I mean, and you now, know, and now even, it's much more stricter. I don't know. I, I think I think you know you can still uh, allow yourself to do whatever you want. Mm. And you know the thing is, um, if, if that is something too much in your mind or occupies your thoughts too much, you know, then um, you're never gonna get through to the the core of what you want to do. You know. So if if you really want to, um, um, you know, uh, to sort of translate that emotion or translate that idea or whatever you you have in your mind then you should just go for it and, and do it and then and then you can be tactical and aware of the mechanisms when you decide to release it but once you know the well, stage before that done. Yeah. yeah once it's done yeah. but the stage before that it's it's i think uh, just a really uh harmful way to to think about yeah, yeah, I completely uh, you know agree. To, to, yeah, yeah. I think I, I think it can only you you can cut yourself in uh, you know yeah you, in you get you, you get yeah. yourself thinking huh I wonder if this will the work th and why the thing would is, you fucking the think thing about is, that yeah you you I mean the the truth is you can never um, keep everybody happy you know 
you know, no, no, nobody's gonna. It's not never gonna happen that that you know people are going to agree with everything you do. So you basically, the, at least my strategy is just do what I do, and then sometimes you know I cross paths with a certain audience, and sometimes you know you gain people, you lose people, and you know yeah. sometimes it's a larger group, sometimes it's a smaller group, and um, yeah, you kind of. Yeah, sort of because if you're just looking path, for the you know? biggest audience, you end up making EDM because if that's the actual yeah. objective, I mean, if you're thinking of how the market works, why would that be a process of when you're yeah. in the studio? That's I mean, I, it's fine. If point. it's, I mean, it's it's re, it's it's another it's another form of creativity, you know, uh, to think about how these mechanisms actually work and to come up with really smart ideas to. Uh, to market your stuff, but you know, only once it's finished. Because yeah, if, if you if you do that w while you're in the studio, you just uh, <laughs> you yeah, know, you're just that, that's going to cloud. That's completely sort yeah. of model and cloud your your ideas. Yeah, and, and, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, I feel like um, I I totally agree with you, Kim. Like I think that there's nothing like more um, like honest, I guess, and oh, than like preserving that relationship with your the music that you're making and like just like blocking everything else. I think it's easier though when you're you're a more secure artist in the sense that you've you've gone through all the waves and that kind of feel and you just you own I don't it. Know. I don't so know. I mean, the, like, I what, like what do you what do you theater. what do you what do you want to see in an artist? Do you want what, if you if you're looking at other artists, what do you Honestly. find more interesting? Yeah. So so that's that's a good question because like for example like going back to like Kai's record. So um, naturally, like when he sent us his music, he sent. Um, music that was kind of fitting in the construct of what he thought would fit our label. But what I always like to do is I always like to ask for more and almost in a very greedy way where I'm like, can I have like eight, ten tracks instead of four? I know it's not typical, but then when I started digging through the catalog, there was this whole array and range. And to me, that was the most beautiful representation of Kai because it was like, this is who he truly is. However, when we first were getting the batch of promos, that's not what was sent to us. And I think often, like, you know, it can be frightening, um, especially with, you know, putting your things out into the internet, which is like, it's just like maximized, right? And there's a lot of, like, the current mechanisms, I guess, not to say that feedback should be blocked, but I think that if um, better mechanisms over time, we evolve to better, like, you know, ways of, um, you know, having the audiences digest this music, it could work. For example, when you get promo emails, you know who the artist is, right? So naturally, if you have any sort of relationship with that person or you, the friend, let's say you're not going to necessarily, <laughs> you might say something. If you're ideally, you want you want to be honest, right? But um, it creates a sort of immediate um, like notion of what you're going to say, and it's not always the most honest. So let's say you didn't know who the artist was, and it was, it was just some algorithm that just throwing tracks at you, and it's purely based off of your um, no like pre-existing sort of like idea of it, then, you know, that might be something that we could evolve to, you know, where it's like, this is all very helpful and productive, ultimately, for the process, because I feel like, you know, like, um, there's this idea of perfection of music, you know, it's like, 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 like what um, Luis was saying, you know, it's like, people get kind of upset that they're not getting an expected thing, you know, and it's like, you know, I don't think that's but, necessarily yeah, productive sometimes. The funny thing is, people are upset that that somebody does something different when also they're not buying the music. So I don't know what people think they yeah. have a right to be yeah. I mean, yeah. Music is fucking yeah, free. You don't get about it. You don't so what is it? Like, there have been times where I love an artist so much that I almost don't. My my perspective is so like tainted oh, because yes. I just I just yeah. And then it's like when I really sit back and listen to the record, I'm like, it might not be one of my favorites from that artist, but like. Uh, because I just have such like a pre-existing notion of like what I like from right. that. That was it, the whole thing. Like, as as a as a listener, like it's been, I, I'm Lewis and I have had this conversation a hundred times. But as a customer, sometimes when a band puts out an album that is completely not what you expected or what you wanted, I'm just as guilty of being like, yeah, we These all. These guys I stuck mean, now. They they sold out, or they have this pop sound, or whatever it might be. And you know, I completely understand on the other side. Like, especially if I was buying this as a CD and it was twenty dollars, and this was my allowance for the week, and I had all that was a that was a different deal. Though. I mean, yeah, now it's absolutely. like just. But but I agree. I mean, we've all when every time I was waiting for the new Skinny Puppy album back in the back in the, it was like, what the fuck did this? are these dudes going to do now? And sometimes right. 
ones were better than the others, but at least it, it yeah. made me what happened, think about what it. What happened you know? when you got that process album? Though? Oh, yeah. dude, exactly, <laughs> exactly yeah. what I was thinking. Oh. And sometimes you get the process, but fuck it. <laughs> but uh, but it this will. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I was just gonna say it happened to me even recently. Like as much as I myself try and change that process and how I, like, you know, try to come up with solutions of like different ways of you know distributing the label's music. Let's say, but like the other day when I was there's a Kanye like listening party and whatnot. I did, like I listened back on it, and I had to kind of like call myself out where I was like, okay, the tracks, the songs, the pieces that I like the most, I like them because I felt like it was like the old Kanye, like the old stuff used to put out. And like, it was like this, like the reason why I fell in love with his music, right? So like, and then I had to be like, wait, but that's like, that defeats the whole point of what I'm trying to get at, which is like, you know, growth and stuff. So it's, it's a very, hum it's a very natural, like, you know, inclination, obviously, but like, um, I think that the, like, the, the sort of like feedback process can be better maybe like on a technical level you know um because it's like it's human to want to try things you know but it's also human to like not necessarily want the change you know as like the audience so so it goes both ways i think it's all it's, it's nice to accept it all you know and at some point i'm just kind of like uh but well, i think it's, it can be frightening when you're first starting off you know sure well the whole point of the belief defect album that we did and how we did it was to avoid that issue. That's why we never signed it. And we released yeah. it and it was never done through, oh, this guy that did this shit and this shit, blah, 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 because that in itself felt a bit alienating for people that are not into techno and then have preconceptions about what techno people do and why is that techno person in this label and not that label and why are they making this fucking thing and not this fucking thing. So by removing yourself from the credit line... Okay, but that's uh, a decision you made afterwards, right? That's not like... Uh, no, 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 it, w it, w it was done while well, we were finishing. I was like, okay, we're going to release this shit. Right, we're, yeah, not gonna, right. we're, we're not going to claim it till it happens. I mean, we're not going to hide from it, but we're not going to market it through our names because that can be positive and negative and nothing has to do with the music. So mm -hmm. Yeah, but now least, people know people know you are belief defect now. Yeah, yeah, but, <laughs> but, the, but, yeah. But, but I mean, Joachim, you heard the album before you knew it was us, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was. I knew it was you before I, I heard it, yeah. So I, oh, I knew, it was the I, other I, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. love that record. I bought it, like, um, myself sorted it as just like a fan and I was like, by the way, I what's, was just, what's, like, to me, I was like mind blown. I was just like, this is so incredible. And then like, um, Tracy say and nice things what to you ladies. guys do during the visual project. <laughs> insane record. Stop making fun of me, Torko. Cool. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's a, it's uh, like any compliment is uncomfortable. But the point is, um, yeah, the idea was to bypass ourselves from the problem. Because then you want to, if you have your credit somehow, that also pushes you in a certain series of decision making, which has sure. to do with image and all that shit, but if yeah, it's... Yeah, because you're famous, it's different, though. <laughs> or, 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 yeah, or, for, or, yeah, even claiming responsibility for it, in a way, but but yeah. none of that shit is actually gonna, should influence people's experience in what listening to the music, so if we were able to remove that pipe, that, that uh, like, that step from relating it to why is that person doing this shit, then maybe... You can't control that, that though. You can't, I know. I think it's that's a good what, intention. But like, you have I mean, no idea as what as Bobby in Illinois is doing Ooh. and his feelings yeah. about it. Yeah, I, I don't mean that that will result in better and more people liking it. But if they don't like it, they don't like it. That's fine. The point is, they don't have to think about it. Why is this? Why? Who made it? That is irrele irrelevant to the actual music. Sure. Yeah, that's that's sure. the thing. That's the thing with uh, aliases or even collaborations and stuff like that. You can hide behind the the, the name. name. Yeah, or not necessarily yeah. that, that, but uh, you know, it's it's you put, you basically put it out there as a, as a different concept, as a different thing. So yeah. it's fine if it sounds different, you know. You yeah, kind yeah. of you kind uh, of yeah, already it it's it's already baked into the in, into the name, you know, because it's an alias and it's like a, not presented under your real name or the, oh. the name you're known under. So you you allow yourself like uh, more sort of room to uh, to be yeah to. Yeah to portray yourself in a different way. I think yeah. if it's coming from like a healthy space, like, like you said, you can, the intent is that, you know, um, and I want to correct myself when I said, I use the word secure as an artist. And I think that was actually the wrong word to use because the reality is the vulnerability of being an artist. And it's like, 
that's a beautiful thing and that should always be preserved and the fact that i think that fear exists where you have to get an alias for the wrong reason you know where you feel like scared and it's okay to be scared you know and that's like the thing that i think is um gets lost sometimes in like the current processes it's like this idea of perfection and like music isn't photoshopped you know it's not like it's not meant to be perfect that vulnerability is what what caused you to like to to relate on that emotional level in the first place you know because nobody just wakes up every day and is like i'm just some badass person and i just make these like because sometimes you don't right like and i think like the fact that you know um again if you're doing if you're taking the alias for a certain reason i think it's great that's like if it's the right healthy thing you know but it's like um i was talking about with karen my agent and it was like she was like it's just kind of painful sometimes to have to see like artists just like like audiences want artists to be this kind of daunting like depressed person like this it's like you can just be like a healthy like happier person and have a healthier approach than have to feel like the fear and it's, it's inevitable to feel different i think i think that's okay you know it's okay that those things seep into your mind because that means you're feeling it right that means you're feeling like that that like relationship because not everybody just wakes up confident all the time even if you're a very confident person or you're not a confident person regardless mm, it's like a human feeling and i think that i think that's beautiful i don't think that's like a weakness you know um but going back to what you were saying sophia about about the point is i think the point is that you can hear the honesty in music or the lack yeah. thereof or in art in general right so sure when i when I the, the the albums I remember the most are the ones that feel like they were being made as I was listening because it yeah. you could hear the flow of the of, of the people doing it. Again, going back to the to the cast you did with Mo, which was happening in real time in every sense, and 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 um, and that kind of represents like a better picture of the moment in time the thing was made, right? And and it, you can link to it better because there's no it feels you feel the honest in the music you don't think the honest in the music right so so if you're in going back to what Joachim was saying that marketing shouldn't be a process in making music because then that's a different business completely it's a business not making music so uh if you start thinking about how is it going to be perceived which is the fear yeah but it's um, tough right like if you're making yeah, it music it's tough because it like well they're two different jobs. Every, they're both. They're yeah. both. They're. They're both have, have their. You know, uh, right to exist and to think about. But uh, you know, mixing them up can be difficult. You know, or can yeah, be dangerous. Yeah, I agree. That, that's yeah. my point. Yeah, exactly. If you're yeah. if you're making music and, and like you're an artist, you're a singer, you're a drummer, you're a guitarist, you're still like having those like daydreams in the shower in the morning where you're like, this track is banging and everyone loves yeah. it and it's so great. Like. You can't lose that either, you know? Yeah. No, of course. That's Sincerity. Yeah, I agree. I think at the end of the day, just like, um, uh, to your point, I guess, Yogam, like preserving the honesty in that process is the most important. If you if you feel dark and you feel down that day, then that's that. the more honest you can be at conveying that, then that's it, you know? And if you feel happy or you don't, and, and if you make a mistake in that, we, for performance, but that's okay too, you know? And I think like, just normalizing that is probably a good thing, you know? Um, Cause yeah. like sometimes, honestly, there have been times where like, I'm like uh, in a performance, let's say, you know, there's like mistakes that are made in a performance and from a technical sense. I appreciate that, frankly. Yeah. Um, there was a time when I didn't appreciate it. And I was like that critical person where I was like, oh, you know, like how, like I'm paying for this show, you know, like how I'm, this person is supposed to be a professional. It's like, um, so I think just like being more open to all of it maybe and just like preserve, like, but the underlying foundation being like the honesty, right? Like, like the more you can be sincere with it, it's just hard when you get scared to like be yourself sometimes, you know, sure. it's like- and Hey, Sophie, so that. that's interesting what you say, Sophia, because you, you just mentioned one thing and saying, um, you know, uh, that the music you make and in maybe one day you feel really, uh, you're in a dark mood. Do you think, do you think that is actually a one-to-one relationship? Like if you're feeling, uh, in a, if you're in a dark mood, the music will turn out dark. I mean, so, no, I made I made so some of my darkest yeah. shit when I was just yeah. having coffee, reading a manual. You know, yeah. I mean? <laughs> so that's a really interesting point because I'm glad you remembered because I was I was thinking about that. Like, so here's another thing. Like, as a decent producer, solid producer, somebody that just knows how to put music together, right? Um, you could technically, if you if the job is given to you, you could really just sit down and write whatever, right? But that's not the point. Is it like honestly the emulation of like so like 
you don't necessarily always have like because equally there's a lot of people that may not necessarily that but like you know be dark in their sort of like artistic aura but then they just write dark music and sometimes there's people that falsify that feeling right and they do it because it's like a formulaic like okay so like I'm well and it's, to or, it's an aesthetic or, so it, whatever yeah. it, it, as long as it's no it, as or, long or, as that feeling is like you know not necessarily like that you have to be feeling like dark in order to write a dark track but well, it, if it's just I, honest I, I, yeah, I, I I think it can it it the real time connection doesn't necessarily need to exist, but the yeah, fact that well, but it is like at least recognize like, the darkness in you. No, it's like an it's like an arsenal <laughs> of of things that you have in in you. You know, like you have an arsenal of things. You everybody every human feels uh, dark or happy or or aggressive mm -hmm. or you know there's all these there's all these things that that are part of you. And you can draw from these emotions and and mm. and kind of use them in your music, but it don't necessarily need to be things that, that you're are. Morose. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. necessarily yeah. need yeah. to be Absolutely. while you're in that mood, you know. Oh yeah, I, I I completely <laughs> agree. I mean, you don't have to be depressed to make depressive music, <laughs> of course. But but the fact that you're able to connect with it in a, in a and it sounds genuine, then it means you're referring to something that you know what dark and depressed is. Doesn't mean it's you like, have to be yeah, dark. Yeah, sure. It's like it's like this uh, this this bag you can draw from, you know? Like oh, yeah, the right. experience. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. I just yeah. like cued like hello darkness my old friend in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean imagine if you had to be depressed to that yeah, no, we do we would shit. I mean there would be no rock and roll if you had to be depressed and you know make uh, the blues, you know, because everybody would be... Um but uh, I forgot what I was saying. It was related to uh, Jakob's comment, but never mind. Was it about dark shit? <laughs> yeah, of course. What is it? <laughs> dark coffee. <laughs> it's about dark coffee. Yeah. By the way, uh, what's what's uh, Mo doing in the comments? You, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> most Mo, most Mo, Mo, Mo most is driving. Right something now. terrible about him yeah. or some shit. <laughs> I think Mo's on the road, and so we don't uh, want yeah. him chatting. We don't be chatting and driving, Mo. Don't be Mo. chatting, yeah. Yeah. Maybe he's doing. A, he's doing a voice that. recognition. Robin yeah. in the comments too, and actually his comment <laughs> was um, like really strikes a chord. Where it's like I often perceive dark sounds as pleasant, and like that's another aspect. Like, like you know, happiness or you're being content with is like it's all subjective, right? So like, sure. to me, like darker sounds calm me down. You know, to me it feels honest and true, and it feels. But for somebody else, like I remember playing record to my sister, and she's like, she's like, this shit is so depressing. Like, can you just like. <laughs> You know, can you just like, and I was like, no, but it's like it relaxes me. Like to me, it's right. relaxing. You know, so certain part, part, sounds. Is really grounded part right part of the problem is there's become this like genre and aesthetic of like dark techno, right? And this yeah. whole there's an outfit and a look and a whole sound you have to have and all. You know, yeah, um, I mean, look at <laughs> really, Look at us. I thought it was just <laughs> the <laughs> way to fucking dress. This way, I don't have to choose no, fucking I, colors. I spill pizza all over myself. That's why I have to wear black. Because Embarrassing. I stay in my clothes. But there's it's like always here. you can you can hear as well when tracks are trying to be like dark industrial techno tracks, and it's just. It's not an honest sound, right? This is just on the same <laughs> yeah. cookie cutter. Like, um, yeah. it's just uh, so far in that direction, you know. Like, well, the thing yeah. is that's what Sophia was saying. That if you think about it, you can deconstruct any formula musically and reproduce it if you're going about it technically and get pretty near it sounding genuine because you you have the technical ability. But the point is, the sure. part where you sound where you hear the honesty in the music, that part is right. not done that way. Yeah, pe yeah, people are smarter than that, right? You know, people that like music and listen to music, they feel it. They, they know it. They can yeah. tell pretty quickly, you know? Yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree so, so, Louise, how, how long did it take you the, for the first album, the one you did with uh, Mo? It was fairly quick. It was uh, okay. when I Because moved the, it, the, the, the reason why I'm asking is because I was, I was just um, sort of hooking into what uh, Iroko was saying. But. Um, it sounds quite elaborate and very kind of detailed and and lots of layers and stuff like that you oh, know yeah, but yeah. That so awesome. how uh, so uh, it's good to hear that you you got it together quickly because uh, to me it sounds like a thing that required a lot, lot of time and thinking and even you know even more so because it's a collaboration so there's two people kind of pulling the pulling Actually, the strings but the thing is uh -huh. what I'm interested in is how do you retain the the original idea or feeling or mood for the second uh, album 
no, or just no. in general? In general, when when you are doing things sort of uh, with interruptions and and from a distance and being together, right, right. you know what I mean? Like, how do you kind of follow it through to the end? You know, when you start with an idea, or start like with, hold like, on you, to the moment kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, the the first record didn't have that because it was done when I mean back before the pandemic, and Mo was here every four months at, at a minimum, and and, and a chunks of a month at a time. So we kind of put it together within under a year, as in the main whole thing, and then I mixed it three times because that's me being obsessive compulsive. So, uh, but that just was like three months later. So I mean, three months have uh, extra. So. We did it that way. We didn't even think about who are we going to pitch it to until it was already almost done because we didn't want to stop and think about it in any sense. So we were just trying to bounce shit off each other and just go with it. And some tracks at the end were like, okay, this is not done. This won't be it. This is when it was done. We kind of felt it. The, the more problematic was the second time and more than the time we've spent together, which is also an issue, is to how to not think about it once you've done it once as in the first time is easier because there's nothing to fail you have at. A blank slate yeah exactly you, you slate, can, yeah. it'll be what it'll be and the second time all the inevitably expectations are generated just because there's a reference so that makes it a little bit more complicated as a concept to to, to work with but i think the second one is uh different in its own it's it sounds different but it sounds the same so as long as we have like a organizing principle under which we can track or work, it'll it, it starts fitting anyway. So I'm not sure. But does the sure distance? The, the, did the, the distance? distance did it did it affect what you're doing? Like you just have this kind of moment of inspiration, right? And you're kind of like flying, and everything's feeling great, and then oh. you keep passing this thing back and forth. How well, do you keep that? Kind of fire first, going on that going back to the first album mo would come and and go like okay i've been recording this shit and just drop just just nothing specific just like a melody he was working on with a progression and gives me the recording and then i can hear the structure around it so that part hasn't changed so whenever he sends stuff and it hits me i'm like okay i can build shit around it or if i send an idea and then he bounces back at me it's that is the same process that has not mm -hmm. changed so, so you you were able to somehow retain the excitement of the initial yeah, yeah. I, spark. I, I actually, yeah, I actually okay. got it again last week after the whole drama of the pandemic, and that was <laughs> the thing I was referring to. The dude sent me a fucking sketch. I don't know, five months ago, and I heard it in Mexico, and I was like, "Yeah, that's a good idea." That was it, and I started kind of working about it, uh, working around it. But I heard it again two days ago, and it, then I heard it for the first time. As in, oh shit, yeah. I wasn't nice. recognizing everything that was there just because of my situation, right? So as soon as I it, it hit me, then it just became instant because then I could hear what I wanted it to do. So it was more of a personal situation or your personal mental space than the actual interaction. If it's there and everybody's clear, then then it's honest again, you know, because then I can recognize that it was really good writing and then I wanted to do something with it. But if I'm daydreaming or unfocused or just worried about, you know, pandemic shit or uh, the rent or whatever, then the problem is a different one and you're not committed, you're not present at the end. So that was the real difference that kind of, that is the, the real di thing about the whole project. Mm. Well, that's good because I, I I noticed that when when I collaborate, I I really need to be in a room with uh, the person, you know, and uh, oh. I I have a difficulty retaining the energy and and uh, uh, stamina to follow through if if there's too much interruption, you know, if there's too many things going up and down, you know, resend version oh. five hundred, you know, <laughs> blah blah blah, you know, I I, I like to get uh, I like to keep the capture the idea as pure as possible and then to you know, stick with that and to retain that sort of initial spark. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, uh, I think that that changes if it's not a collab as in uh, just uh, one. I mean, you can focus that. Obviously, that works because if you're doing a, an album or a EP, then that is a focus. If it's a long thing and it happened organically through distance, so it's not something specifically we miss. It's just we built it around it somehow. So, mm -hmm. yeah. 
but yeah, I understand what you're saying. You can sometimes also miss out on like, the, um, I agree that obviously like this, the real time, you know, what's happening in that room and that energy, but also sometimes when you, when you do pass tracks on or I guess it, it's really situational, but sometimes it also um, allows you more freedom also to like, let's say one of the other people in the collab is in a certain headspace that's not what's happening then and there, but if they, then they get that idea and then they can, they, you know, they can touch it up with, on their timing, you know, because the timings don't always like, even if the, the sync is going really well and the collab is going good in that room that day, there's something that could strike somebody in a different time, you know, that's not happening there. So sometimes, I think both can, can sometimes work. Um, it's, it's not always like, it's, it, I think it's always not like one one formula. <laughs> yeah, that, that was my reference to if you're working on a track or a couple of tracks, then yes, the moment is there. And then if you can close it and finish it, you got it. But if it's an album and if it's going to be a second album, a third album, then that just opens up the timeline to work around it because you cannot be in the same room all the time because, you know, he's in L.A., so... So, but yeah, I mean, I agree in both uh, both positions. So then, yeah, the, you, the moment. Do you live in Berlin, Luis? You, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, obviously, so, when you're some, when, when you're somebody, you you're reacting in real time, and that is actually that is the the flow, you know. As in, somebody says something, you can say something back. But if it's just, it, it, and then the track is done. But if it's like. A, it still has to be an album, so if it's not happening there, we still have to bounce it back to each other, even if it's at a slower rate, in a way. Mm. Yeah. So the chat is asking, uh, do you have a label in mind when you work on a track? I think that's what the question was. Yeah, um, Sonder, bring it back. Here we go. Yeah, oh, there yeah. we go. Awesome. So for, for, me, for me personally, um, no. It's usually, I will finish a track sometimes with a label in mind like there will be once a label maybe approaches me for things um i'm not really the type of person that makes stuff and sends it to labels i'm just i have too too scared to do that probably but um <laughs> and i'm also lucky enough to have a network of people that are interested in music or there's like a particular project um so um no i i never do that uh you know, maybe if it is a friend's label or it's something we're thinking about doing together and it makes a lot of sense. But uh, yeah, because, you know, what what does a label even mean now? You know, the sound, labels don't necessarily even have a sound anymore. And I think when I'm mu making music, I don't even know how it's going to turn out myself. I don't have that level of like control, right? I think even if I want to track the sound a particular way, I'm not that good of a producer, so it just kind of ends up where it's going to end up. So it's, uh, that is what it is. And so it's, if it fits in the label and the label wants it and anything works out, that's where it goes. I mean, I don't know how many people do actually think, uh, I'm going to make this track for this label. I mean, I don't think it happens that way. You just like a label and you naturally do stuff that is similar because you like it and then it might fit but i don't know who has done like i'm gonna do a track for this label that's completely off character and then hit it you know because it's well, kind of weird i i hear this a lot from from people who um you know follow master classes here at store or on the discord server sometimes it comes up too you know but i think it's um it's something that uh the probably the more inexperienced people think that's how it goes mm -hmm. um but i to all those people i would say you know uh, try to uh get into the mind of the label does a label want to release something they've already done before you know like yeah. a label is also in in most you know in most cases in, in if it's a, if it's a label with some kind of uh, vision or thought behind it or an aesthetic or somebody who's running it who has a certain taste or a mind for you know for certain music would that person actually release something that sounds like stuff that is being released on that label yeah, exactly. before you know what i mean yeah, yeah. so I, I think it's much more uh, effective to just send the stuff that just comes out of you to yeah, labels that you completely. think might be interested, but don't produce stuff for, for a label because yeah. you're basically repeating what the label is, has already don't, done. Just like and the algorithm in YouTube. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Don't, yeah, don't, yeah. Don't, don't <laughs> send, the same thing, just a little different. Don't send something that's totally 
to the wrong cool. label though at the same yeah. time don't oh, send like I, the wrong genre i, mean, I don't think there's any like damage they... of that sorry i'm sorry please go ahead Stop what is there, what, if you send it to somebody and it doesn't like it well that's it i mean why i mean fuck send it, it to still hurts want. it still hurts well, yeah Come but on. everything hurts so you <laughs> better like, get oh. on with it right oh man every time a label's like off. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> but that is part of the whole process at the end you know you have to learn that some people that doesn't mean it's a bad track it means they don't like it that's it you know that's it's the hard. reality of it well i got so it makes me good. cry okay now now it's becoming a struggle session i think i think uh, a label declining something has very little to do whether the person who is actually listened to the music likes yeah, it or likes the music or not it is so many different factors you know it's the uh, the the load on the release schedule you know the, the, all the that, budget the image the budget, everything. yeah yeah it's there's lots of other stuff I anyway say, though, i hope this i hope this answers the questions of uh, uh, before we before we steer off to another question and this is regarding uh Joachim, um uh what was the question that if uh, somebody does that for a specific label fuck i forgot never mind back to you sophia Sorry. let's move on What's oh, the no, fear? What were you going to say? say like, Sorry, just for God, well, point, okay. Point Stop of, like, her off. The records that defied labels and that made, like, the, the records in, historically that have basically uh, claimed the sound of a lot of major labels today were the breakthrough records. They were the crazy sure. things. That was the whole right. point of it, right? right? Yeah. And those things defied the labels. So now if you remove that and keep it in line, then you're just swimming with the stream. So it's like, it's like such a, it's always such a, um, an ongoing, like, you know, I think struggle uh, for labels specifically because it's like, yeah, sure, on one hand, there's like this sort of logical sound that they put out. But then it's like, I, I would love if we lived like, you know, hypothetically in a world where it was like, when somebody's sending me tracks for my label, it's like, how do you know what I want to listen to? You know, like, you don't know the headspace of that. It's so, so then effectively all of my decisions on what I'm putting out are based on something, you know, outside of my headspace, right? So, but when I just think about like the records that were the most definitive, they were the break, they were the weird thing. They didn't match necessarily the label, like, yeah. you know, and um, that was the whole point of like, that's the whole point of innovation, right? Right. Yeah. Oh, I remember. Can I interrupt? Before I interrupt, so you're you're Again. running like a, like as like like a teaching uh, program, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So when uh, when the kids already know the, all the technical shit, and now it's like here, now it's your turn because you know you you learn how to do it appropriately, professionally, all this shit. Now it all becomes about creativity and headspace. Do you actually talk about that with the uh, with the kids or not? That's mostly what we talk about. Oh, that's fucking cool. I mean, because it's like a psychological prepping to to the kind of pitfalls that happen with uh, with making music. Well, you know, I mean, uh, everybody's. It, it is. It, I think it's pretty useless to explain people how to make music technically. You know, because everybody who's been doing this, like, I, I, I'm sure that all all the four of us, they you know, have totally own own sort of self-developed methods of getting things done you know i mean mm -hmm. there's not just one way how to do it you know how to get something recorded or you know there's some basic rules you got to stick to but you know they're pretty easy but you mm -hmm. know how somebody translates their idea into something that is audible for other people is you know can be That's done a in a thousand different ways you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. uh, so that's you know that's something that that we you know, once once I kind of figure out how the person is actually approaching his stuff, um, then uh, then I, I kind of know the pitfalls and and um, you know uh, how they might be able to improve their their productivity if they're spending too much time on one thing and maybe ignoring other things. You know, uh, but other than that, it's pretty much just uh, yeah trying to uh, to get to the bottom of things so they can. Uh, find their inner voice, you know. They find their voice, yeah, yeah. And find their uh, their their style or whatever. And I think that's that's way more important than teaching yeah, how, I, how I to agree. copy clips, you know. <laughs> no, but that's that was my whole point. I mean, because that yeah. is at one point you can get the technical thing done, and then you have to deal with okay, so cr be creative, and then yeah. that becomes a different problem together. So all together, so the fact that you're actually focusing on that, that I think that is the, the winning approach. 
No, it's fun because uh, I, I meet a lot of people with uh, amazing ideas. You know, it's uh, it is just the f the fact that they uh, most of them uh, haven't been releasing much or they're just starting to. So uh, to get from the from the point where they you know start messing around with gear to something presentable is is you know there's a few steps needed to to get, get that there. done you know yeah. and uh, and some some people are just stuck in, in in one phase of the of the of the whole chain and never get to the end you know so that's why I'm trying to to help them to move along to get some results you know to get some oh that's cool yeah, yeah that's cool yeah so uh, but th I think the 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 the, the way at which you arrive at, at a point doesn't technically doesn't really make uh, that much difference, you know. As long as you're capable of, um, uh, you know, shaping your your idea in some way, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah. yeah. At the end of the day, the technical part, the technical part is technical. So yeah, it has. Yeah, it's muscle two. memory after a little while, right? Yeah, it's exactly. like you're, you you get yeah, your toolbox I mean, ready. Yeah. I, I think yeah. I think you don't need to be that technical to to get some amazing stuff going. You know, I mean. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, um, yeah, it's just um, uh, there are many, many choices you can make along the along the way that that shape your sound, you know, and and it doesn't have anything to do with how technical you are. It is just a you know manipulation of whatever is going on to into a state where it kind of fits your aesthetic, your idea, whatever, and that's you know that's not too technical to be honest. Well so um, Submerge has a question. Uh, hey, Submerge, a long question. Uh, when do you feel it's time to move on from a track? I know sometimes the more you fiddle with it, it can cause a negative effect. Uh, this is a tough one because Submerge and I work on music together. And I, I would <laughs> say that um, we fiddle it's with personal. each other's tracks so much that we often will ruin each other's ideas sometimes. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's one of those things that um, you kind of will know or the deadline will dictate it, right? And um, even still, I will overdo a track and kind of regretfully, you know, a month later be listening to it and just be like, man, it was better just raw the way it was. And, you know, um, you know, you just... You ne that never goes away, right? You you just never. So what do you what do you do in a case that? like that? Do you go? Do yeah. you eventually just use the 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 raw one or? Um... No, I just try to forget it, it ever existed because <laughs> oh, you know because wow. you, know, okay. <laughs> you know the potential was there, and then you the, you know it's come out, and the but, end result is out there, and you're like, yeah, I mean, you just pack that one up for a loss, you know, and well, you get it you know, buried under the releases, you know. This happens actually quite a lot, you know. I speak to a lot of people like who do this for a living, and. Um, I think I would say that half of them uh, have have the tendency to overdo things, but uh, and then at some point, you know, decide, okay, I've tried everything, uh, I killed it. Let's go back to version like five versions before, or like sure. uh, the initial one, maybe, maybe even, you know. Do you, do uh, so you, it's, it's completely natural, it? but <laughs> but are you, you able to go back to it and find it? What 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 was it Sometimes. interesting to begin with? Yeah, you can. Well, all of you. Sometimes you lose it though, right? Like because yeah, it was can, that I pattern, can. and I yeah. it never came off the drum machine, and we messed with it too. I mean, this is also the advantage of for me working with someone as technical as Submerge, right? Like he he's just a wizard in the studio in a way that I'm not, and so he can say when things are kind of ready and done, and stop me when I'm in crazy mode and think it needs a million other things and it has to get crazy in these parts and you'll be like you are just this is ridiculous you can time for <laughs> well, you to go to sleep you know so personally you know when you when you say it when you were a kid and you were repeating a word and then at one point it loses meaning you're just making sounds and, and you're thinking sure, about how same it, thing same thing if, exactly when you get with a you start with a good loop and you're like ah damn this is the bomb and you're just and then you stop engaging in, in it and yeah, you start kind of flip to marketing side if you will or whatever other side it, there is then you listen to the fucking thing and then you start fucking with it and then it just means nothing and even if it still sounds good to you yeah. it doesn't mean shit anymore this is why sometimes it's best just to shelve that loop or shelve that bit yeah, probably. come back to it later when you have a fresh set of ears and you're not yeah, so weird, obsessed weird with the, the, the 
the most meaningless part of it. You're spending hours on that. You know, so. Yeah, I agree completely. I think I think it's a really um, good thing to work on as an artist to kind of uh, be be very close to what you're doing and also at the same time being able to step back uh, or take enough uh, distance from it to kind of um, evaluate what you're doing through sort of almost like through a second pair of ears like the spectator's ears you know and a spectator doesn't mean exactly an audience or not necessarily like somebody else but yourself as as you know sort of watching from above or watching from a distance to your own work. Yeah, objective. if you can yeah if you can switch between those modes easily, yeah, yeah, yeah. then then, then you're you, a pro. you spend then you're a pro. <laughs> well yeah, but, but then that's why it's, you it's save yourself a lot of time somebody. fucking around yeah. you know what i mean yeah, <laughs> yeah. but i mean i mean this is a question to the three of you which i'm guessing is the same at least what i've when you have a track and you think it's good and you show it to somebody, before you even hit the parts that you're not unsure of, you already have a clear idea of, oh, this shouldn't happen there, this shouldn't happen there, because you're already listening to an, with it with, to another person, so you kind of detect the overindulgence of whatever section or something, mm. even if they actually, before they, they make an opinion, because you know it already, you just don't want to see that uh, until you change it to, like, objectivity. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. Like listening to it with somebody else forces you to be objective about it. And objective being neutral, not being positive or negative, because you don't call this thing of hating the music already. Then you're being not. Then you're being, you know, object uh, subjectively against yourself. So you're not even being fair to the music. Even that's it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think. I think it's. Um um something you can develop easily if you if you just uh you know uh try to switch your head between the two modes uh regularly you know um actually it's um the 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 sort of initial spark or the initial idea or the initial excitement you feel when you're doing something that is always something that i'm chasing you know and um right uh, I, I really don't want to overdo things <laughs> anymore, yeah. you know, uh, uh, so, um, and, you know, by, by trying to stick to the, uh, to the essence, you know, and, and not, you know, dressing it. it up with all these, you know, sort of, uh, unnecessary dress up, uh, glitter and stuff like that, you know, you, you, you yeah, it's, it's, um, I find myself being quicker that way, you know, yeah, of just, course. Uh, right, just right. get it down, you know, get it out of the way next one, you know. Yeah, the, you have to have detachment to do that also. Yeah. You, so that allows you to, if it's wrong, like, oh, fuck it, it's, it, it didn't work out. But it's not a tragedy. So Yeah, and it's more fun too, you know. It's yeah, lighter. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Ex exactly. Yeah. 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 I, I agree completely. It's like uh, you have to learn music or make music, and now that you know that you have to get a psychology degree to get yourself out <laughs> of the way. It, it also helps to be fucking Speedy J to have the confidence to yeah, come forward in a track, right? Yeah. You know? So. Well, not really. I mean, everybody <laughs> good, doesn't mean... Actually, you could make the case for the opposite, which is because he's Speedy J, then there's more pressure. But it isn't. It could be yeah, either absolutely. way. Yeah, That's true. That's true. Well, you know, the thing is, you know, how much do you permit yourself to kind of deviate from uh, the path that people think you're on, you know? And, right. uh, um, and I, I don't... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty... Uh, unaffected by that, so um, that's why I can be quick. <laughs> no, you know, it's, it's what whatever comes out comes out, you know. Slow right. clap to you. Yeah. But there is a confidence in your music, right? Like, and and you can really you can really hear that. Well, I don't know. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's something I don't I don't necessarily hear. You know, it's like uh, mm -hmm. maybe that's just uh, practicing. You know, that's just experience. I guess you know. Um, I don't know. I mean, but everybody has that. I, I guess you know, if if you're if you're in the game long enough, you know, you develop your your um, vocabulary and your you know, um, you, yeah, you your, know who you your are. Your bag of your your, right. your 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 voice, your your bag of tricks and stuff like that. You know, and and um, you can just uh, do it without even thinking about it. You know, it's like uh, I I I know that you know this feeling too, right? If you're if you're playing out. Half, you know, most of the time you're not even thinking what about what you're doing. It's just uh, intuition, right? It's just baked in your in your system. Yeah, that's, right? But that's a flow, as in because yeah. that is the pr that is the whole, you know, Eckhart Tolle present moment. Because you're just there, right. and it feels, and you react. You don't act as in pre-planned. You're just 
reacting to the set. If you're doing a show and you're there and, exactly. and you're connected to the thing, then the path is in a way kind of set. But if you're thinking yourself out of your position, then it's a struggle yeah. because you feel your way through the set. You don't think your way through the set technically as in necessarily. Yeah, and of course, it's not always possible to, yeah. <laughs> to. And you have to be lucky when when you end up in yeah. situations where that is all happening in the right way. You know, perfectly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I've, uh, it's, uh, I've got to dip out, guys. I'm sorry, Yoga. I'm gonna let you. Uh, oh no! Just a quick. Oh, okay. I heard that that Mo is uh, replacing me, though, so it's a nice surprise for everyone. Oh no! Um, all right. Yeah, um, what a, but I'll what a like, terrible Yeah, place. I'll, um, I guess, like, to the question or whatever, and then I'll, I'm going to head off. I've just got a deadline for something. So um, I think, like, for me, at least, to answer Orlando's question earlier, uh, just, like, uh, trying to, like, wrap my head around becoming at peace with the process has, has been the most rewarding thing. And not to say that it's always perfect, but, like, um, the reality of it is you're never quite there. You're never going to be a master of anything because you're always learning. You're always growing and you're always like in ideally should be open to the change. But like, I think just accepting the whole process is like probably the best thing, you know, cause it's like, like earlier today I was, uh, like I hadn't checked like my boiler room stream in quite a while. And I was like, frankly depressed from, from that boiler room cause there's all this pressure on your person. And it was like, the worst performance of my life. Like even just no, purely from like cool, a stage though. fright. Well, purely cool. from like a stage fright perspective, right? Yeah. And like mind you, I was like a dancer for ten years, so I never had stage fright prior to doing this like boiler room stream. And I was thinking about it and I was like, the reason why, um, not necessarily because your performance could be good or bad for many reasons, right? But like it was to me that impression was so important because of my attachment to it. And I think like learning to become detached from like whether it's an ego thing or whether it's um, an emotional feeling thing, regardless, just like there's always there's ups and downs in this whole process. And I remember Francis Nares was telling me this once, and he was like, kind of joking. He was like, he's like, I've been. And he was like, how's it going? And I was like, I feel like I was like things are going up, like I'm learning. So he goes, I've been saying that for the last thirty years. He's like, you're not like, and I'm still not there, you know, because it's like it's ongoing, and like sometimes there's good, sometimes they're bad, you know, and it's like. I don't know. I think uh, for me, at least, like just like trying to like make peace with that is probably the most like has been yeah. the most yeah, beneficial. <laughs> totally agree. Absolutely agree. Yeah. yeah, it's an ongoing process. It will it will be till the day you die. Yeah, <laughs> literally. <laughs> yeah. Um, on that note, I'm gonna <laughs> head out. But I'll thank see you, so you Saturday. Much for having you guys enjoy the rest of the stream. Yes. Yeah, see you soon. Bye bye. Well, yeah. Thanks, Sophia. You. Thanks for dropping by. Really of good course, to see you. Of course. Anytime. Thank you for having me. Ciao. So Mo's gonna drop now? I think so. Oh no! <laughs> there goes what, the, what a, there goes the neighborhood. What, what a terrible <laughs> consolation prize! Uh, uh, please <laughs> tell us what you think, really. <laughs> oh come on! Man. Um, um, but yeah, it's weird how quick. what what he drove pretty quick. I have no idea. Oh, oh, there's Tokyo stuff. Drift. Oh, oh, wait, wait. Oh, rosy cheeks and everything. Oh, oh Jesus. <laughs> wow. Welcome. Oh, the mighty sunburn, you know. Though. I've been in the beach for a week. Oh, you poor thing. thing. You. I just decided to chop in the show and ruin your guys' flow. Okay, say <laughs> something relevant now. Well, I was just listening to all the wisdom that Sof Sofia was dropping, and it just made me realize that how much I'm failing on a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> this is the tone we want. Just this the was, worst <laughs> takeaway from everything. Oh, you know yeah, what? Yeah. I'm an idiot. Sorry. Oh, it's because like, I just lean into the misery just a little bit more. <laughs> you know? Just yeah. push into it. Sorry. Anyways, oh, wow. good chat that I've been listening to, though. Is it is it uh is it uh meaningful in any personal way? <laughs> it's hard to find anything that's meaningful these days, but you know. <laughs> oh, dude, wow. dude, dude, please wow. just lay down the fucking doom and gloom, goddamn. <laughs> just kidding. I had a great week though, and I'm here with my son, and I wouldn't be surprised if he runs in here. So I par apologize in advance. Mm. Hi, Mo. Hey, Everybody say hey, hey Mo. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, so yeah, good to see you, man. How are you? Yeah, not bad. Not bad. Um nice one. You know. 
So, yeah, so we, by the way, now that somebody said hi, drum cell, are you gonna go with drum cell at Spinoza at one point? Uh, when you're older. Yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> I don't know. As in, <laughs> as in, the, as in, yeah. My dad is drum so like yeah, that's a weird thing to say about you know an adult. That's what I'm saying. I'm just yeah. making fun of him. <laughs> you know, okay. it just just sticks with you. Yeah. Unfortunately, my son has no idea what I do for a living, so I don't think he has any reason why to call me drum solo. That's for sure. Give it time. Yeah. Well, you know, it's I I, I wouldn't say it's a. Uh, you know, it's not very healthy if uh, if your kids are a fan of what you're doing, right? I mean, yeah. have, yeah. I mean, who likes the music <laughs> their parents make? You know what I mean? <laughs> but oh, oh, look at that! How we segue into that fucking whole miserable thing. Um, uh, I mean, when did you start making music? Like, uh, when did you start publishing shit, uh, Joachim? Like at uh, the nineties, right? Uh, yeah, late eighties. Oh, yeah, late eighties. Yes. Yeah, so that kind of last uh, when raving happened and all that shit happened, right? Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I was making music and uh, I was doing like uh, hip hop stuff, you know, beats and tapes and shit. And and then uh, the first uh, uh, acid and you know Chicago and Detroit stuff started sort of uh, trickling into the into the record shops, and I was like, what the f what the hell is this, you know? <laughs> so I, I was hooked, you know, instantly. It was so alien from from anything else that was going on at the time. So that was, uh, it, you know, immediately got my attention, yeah. um, and and that's when I got into it. But isn't so. it weird that nothing has happened in the last twenty years? Nothing has happened. What do you mean? Yeah, as in look at the rate of new music happening in the nineties to the two thousands. After the two thousands, it kind well, of just trickled into know. a very I, slow rhythm of novelty. I don't know. It's. I think. I think. Um, the th the thing that made it different is uh, that it kind of all all sort of went hand in hand with um, a, s a lot of cultural and political changes. You know, like the fall of you know the the wall came down in Berlin, and um, you know there was a new drug, and you know there, there was, was new this, shit happening. Yeah, there was like uh, yeah, it was like a whole that that time a lot of things changed culturally, and and you know anyway. But I, I think every every generation or every uh, everybody in their early you know sort of twenties or late late teens experiences something uh, that sort of shapes their um, taste and and culture in in later life you know um, and I don't think that is that is any different now from from what it was then only this thing became this huge industry that we are all in and and, and a part of. But I think that happens all the time, you know. Uh, yeah, I, think, I mean, I agree with it completely. Sorry, go ahead. I think, Paul, sorry. I think, I think to add to what Luis was saying, um, I, because we've had this discussion before, this isn't a new topic. I don't like to talk about the past, though. <laughs> no, I mean, it's a why, why would, you know, it's, it's yeah. really well, I, trauma I trigger. Your trauma yeah. trigger. <laughs> we won't no, go no, I won't, trauma shit. I won't go into it too, too deeply, but I, I would, I, the only thing I was going to note on that was it seems that um, over, so many decades, even going back to the 20s, when you go to the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, each one of those decades has some sort of defining moment musically. Yeah. And then as soon as we hit the 2000s, it just kind of felt like everything just got blurred. There wasn't really a defining point in 2000s, 2010s, and now here we are in the Well, 2020s. but that's also because because that's that's the moment when distribution of music and accessibility to music uh, changed uh, completely, you know. Yeah. All these times before, <laughs> you were, you know, people were, you know, listening to whatever was on the radio or very sort of uh, channeled uh, uh, outputs, you know, or uh, the yeah. very limited accessibility. And all of a sudden, you know, with the rise of the internet and music being distributed over the internet, everything, you know, it became like a cloud of information and the curation kind of uh, died, oh, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's... But, uh, to, say, but, that, but that, to say that, that nothing... But to say that nothing interesting has happened is kind of no. That's not true. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not because then you're I'm just not, shitting on yourself and no, everything. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not excusing I'm okay myself from, from the process. Okay yeah, yeah, of course, freak. But uh, the thing is, that's my point. The thing is uh, that that whatever was happening that made things meaningful before, which was what Joachim was referring to, which is uh, the internet that somebody posted. It, the internet happened. 
that just kind of made the Bro, consequences in old. real life kind of diffuse. It, it, it makes we're everything go old. slower. Yeah, we're but that's old. my point. Where is the new music? Oh, it's there's there. tons sometimes. of music out there. We're just too old to see. Not, it. not. No. Uh, sorry, there was a new scene. Let me let me put it this way. Not for, they don't. For they don't let. We're too old to see it. That's how cool it is. <laughs> Hopefully, I really hope so. I mean, I really, really, really hope so. Speak for yourself. I see everything. Uh, <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I'm just kidding. You're the one that sees everything. Yeah. yeah. I, so yeah. I'd like to believe at least. <laughs> Joachim, I got an interesting question. I mean, did your kids ever grow up listening to any of your music at all? No. Well, they they know they know it exists, you know, and and they've mm -hmm. they've come along to certain you know places where I played, but they're not fans, you know. They're like <laughs> they're indifferent. <laughs> they're indifferent about it, you know. They they yeah. I don't know. It's uh, it's like they they grew up with uh, me making music, and that's just how it is, you know. Is that's anybody not... of your kids making like interested in making music? Oh yeah, yeah. They're both really musical and really interested, but uh, oh, cool. yeah, not uh, not techno though. <laughs> yeah, the uh, but music at the end. So yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. No, 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 but it's, it is, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it is just normal, you know. It's like, uh, um, it, it's not really that important what you, what you, what your dad does, you know. It's just a fact, you know. It's not like a shaping a shaping factor or something. I don't know. Mm. What about you, Mo? You're just, you're just gonna rebel against what your dad does, right? Well, yeah, it's yeah. supposed to be, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my kid's going through a phase right now where all he listens to is eight bit video game music. Like oh, the nice. classic eight bit video game stuff. And well, he's I, young to be able to choose that. Oh, that's but that's all he though. wants to listen to. And like, that's you know, I, cool. I I try to make a conscious effort when we're in the car to like, you know, go down a series of maybe musical influences that might be able to permeate at his age. He doesn't give a shit. He just wants to listen to eight music. Just just play him your stuff in the, through a bit crusher. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be happy. <laughs> oh, man. But how old is it? He's four and a half, right? Ezra? Four and a half. And he's yeah. listening to eight bit music. That's that's peculiar. Yeah, I mean, you know, he because he really got into video games, and I don't know why he just has an affinity to classic video games. He, he always wants to play the old stuff, um, you know, because all these new gaming consoles have, like, emulators of old games, and he just gravitates to all the old stuff. And he Because he can tell that. you like it. That's why. Maybe, but at the same time... I told him exactly the same thing. Yeah. Like, the thing is, that like it. the one thing I've noticed is the thing that he enjoys the most about those games is the music. He and, he and he hums it and sings along to it the whole day. So that's dope. Uh, that's dope. I'm talking about the Mario Brother or Mario and the 8-bit thing. The mm -hmm. the composer, you sent me this, right, Mo? When the, the guy yeah. that wrote the, the music died, they did like an homage with actual piano or, or guitarist uh, doing the music. It's actually fucking complex music. Like, uh, yeah, he was music. an incredible, incredible music composer. Uh, uh, he was fucking good. And became the the this humming thing of cheap cheap uh, microchips. <laughs> uh, Rukon or Rukon? Uh, How do you balance your creative time making music? Do you only oh. when you are inspired? And do you have a strict strict schedule? Let's have Mo talking because he just joined us. Mo, how does how does it work for you? <laughs> yeah, how is your schedule? <laughs> Well, yeah, my schedule's a little bit rough these days with a four-year-old, um, especially during this pandemic because um, my wife was working a lot more and I'm not traveling and working as much. So I kind of took over being full-time house dad and I have the kid with me the largest majority of the time. Um, so I, I do have days that are particularly scheduled for me to actually get in the studio and write music. But even on those days, I find myself incredibly exhausted and I just want to rest. <laughs> So it's not the most productive time for me at this particular moment, but I'm hoping as um, as I move through this stage of parenthood, I hope that time becomes more so, free. So yeah, yeah. Well, that'll happen, you know, for sure. You know, it's, yeah. Uh, but but the thing is, you're you're not sitting around until you get inspired or you feel like the muse coming into your <laughs> into your <laughs> studio or something. You just sit down and and make it work somehow. Yeah, I mean, especially, I mean. It's funny because 
I, the old way that I used to write music was definitely, you know, based on emotion mostly when, when I, when I felt the need to create music because I needed a vent some way, somehow is when I went to the studio to write stuff. Um, nowadays being on a schedule, it's more difficult because it's like, shit, I only have like eight hours in the day to get some stuff done. I got to sit down and you don't have time to, you know, live that kind of romanticized version of writing music where it's all like, Oh, you know, I'm going to light some candles and get in the mood. I got to sit down and get to work and make the best of it. Make, but make yeah, it but I mean, well, but are you, are you less productive though? Or are you equally as, as productive as before? I would say it's a different type of inspiration because now I'm more inspired by the equipment and the gear around me. So there's almost like, because of my, my, my affinity for electronic music instruments that I'm inspired by the instruments and the sounds mm -hmm. that it makes. Um, I was going to, because earlier when I was listening to the conversation in the car and someone was saying, you know, I'm going to, I think Sophia was saying something about making music when she was happy or something like that. And it, it just occurred to me at that moment that um, I've always, always used music as, as a way, as a cathartic experience, as a way to vent things. Maybe I haven't been so good at using my voice or talking to people when I'm in a shit mood or I'm pissed off or I'm upset or something. So I've always turned to music where I think that's why my music has always kind of reflected a lot more of a moodier and darker side of things. Whereas when I'm in a good mood and I'm happy because I'm not a miserable piece of shit all the time, <laughs> but when, when I'm in a good mood, I, I tend to go do other things that are my hobbies and things that I like to do when I'm in a good mood and I'm happy. Like mm. whatever I mean, it is. Like, I, if you're I'm, linking misery to music making. I don't know if I'm linking to it, but I find it I find it the best way to get shit out of my system. Like some people might go punch a a punching bag to get their, you know, bad feelings out or whatever they're doing. Um, I just found that music is the best way for me to get shit off my chest. Yeah. But and let I, me let me interrupt Mo on his lack of objectivity regarding his process. Sure. Because Please I've I've actually me. been 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 uh, listening to the full and uh, we pimp like we we volley like uh, this idea or that idea or, or how or technique in general and somewhere around six months ago this fool got to a template of uh for bidwick where he could just like throw ideas and, and get them developed and that shit just resulted in oh i did this in two hours oh i did this in one fucking hour and i'm like what the fuck are you complaining about you're actually mm. doing it he just doesn't acknowledge it so i'm putting a marker as in He's partially like he just suffers through the project, through the process, but he's actually much more productive. Well, that's what I that's what I I was asking, you know, because um, uh, of course uh, I, I I went through the, the phase with uh, with young kids as well, but uh, I found myself uh, you know going to adjusting to a, a tighter schedule and making better use of my time eventually and and being equally as, as productive you know so it's it doesn't really need to stand in the way you just don't fuck around as much you know you yeah. just don't light the candles and you know put, put the lava lamp in the right spot and stuff like that you know you fuck the lava lamp you know what i mean just get, get on get on with the job you know what i mean so it's that i i guess you know if once you learn to use your time more wisely then uh it doesn't yeah. need to stand in the way of your productivity at all uh, well, it's always just that, like Go ahead. I was going to say that the thing that, that made that more apparent to me that it was possible to be creative without being so, um, you know, Time getting, in, getting inspired and in the mood or something was how well I worked under deadlines. I mean, somebody can give me a remix and I had like, you know, you say you got three months to do this. Oh, perfect. That's plenty of time. Let's you be real. The, the largest majority of us <laughs> don't start until three days before that deadline. Comes <laughs> or up. Three days after, right? <laughs> <laughs> or that, you know? So when that deadline comes up, you just like get down and that, that amount of pressure, like shit, I got to get this done pushes you to get through um, you know, all the stuff that I usually suffer through and then you, you actually get shit done quick and get it. And it's, that kind of made me realize, oh, well, I guess that kind of romanticized vision of making music while, well, you know, I'm in this expressive mode isn't always necessary. You can get shit done in a constraint, time constraint and still be creative. You just, I don't know, sometimes we're inspired by that external pressure or something. Yeah, but I think having a kid, having that kid and have that limited amount of time cool. is another form of that pressure. Instead yeah, of yeah, a yeah. record label breathing down my neck, it's like, shit, I got eight hours to do this before yeah, yeah, exactly. you know, I'm fucking cooking you but know, it's pancakes working. That's, that's my for people. Cooking eight big yeah, dinner. For, 
<laughs> for me, there's always been, there was early on this idea that I would have to hit this flow, right? Like this feeling's got to be there. The stars have to align. I have to be in this mood. That's when I'm going to work on music. And this inspiration and flow is going to hit. And like part of this is like, it's like chasing a high that you're going to hit yeah. this flow. And sometimes it happens. Like, but like you cannot rely and think it's going to show up. That's where kind of like the technique and the work come into this, right? Because it's like yeah, but the chasing itself is the is the is the thing you have to do. You know, once you're chasing, yeah. as long as you're chasing something, then yeah. uh, you'll finally you'll eventually hit at uh, the moment where where things start clicking together. And right. uh, if if you just wait and sit back, you know, and watch your watch your screen, nothing or you know, person. nothing happens. You just uh, you have to go to sit down, do some work, and and then yeah, chase, chase, chase. You know, just keep chasing. That yeah, fits into the my... whole circle and conversation where structure yeah. and objective drives you forward. Yeah. Some of my favorite releases, I can say, looking back, that I never hit that like feeling of flow state when I was working on this track. It was, it really was work, and it was really like you know me fucking crying, wanting to go to bed, but I have to get this thing done. And looking back on it. I was way more attentive to certain things because of that, right? And I wasn't relying on, like, I'm um, grooving and dance around the studio and this is the best thing. I was seriously just sitting there clicking and, and, and maybe even shortcutting things because I was running out of time on them, you know? So. But then, then it isn't a technical problem because if you needed to resolve a deadline, you obviously are capable of doing it. So this idea that you have that you're lost in technique, that is not exactly the most accurate either. Because you are able to do to go through the problem when you need to. No, nope. most screen keeps changing. No, I'm sorry, I just yeah, yeah. distracted by most screen. No, I totally agree with you. I totally agree. Right. With you. Yeah, like the misery is the self-indulgent part of oh, you know, feelings and shit. What's up, buddy? <laughs> no, you muted the mic. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. Yeah. laughs> yeah, you know, it's just it's like you can't. You always want this feeling where you feel like you have your like space shuttle and all your gears all working together. And everything and, works. And I'm everything sorry. works and you're just yeah. jamming. But like, like man, when you're playing a set and that you're stressed less, and you cannot flow. That's less and less, mm. you know, that's less and less. And that you you can't let that stop you from actually making stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely a, a romantic thing, a uh, romantic vision about what it is to be a musician or <laughs> or a producer or whatever. But it's the same thing as, you know, what people think a painter or a writer is, you know, like, yeah. uh, you know, with uh, the nice hat on and uh, the, the painting gear, you know. <laughs> That's not how it is. It's a fucking struggle. Sometimes you hit it on, yeah, sometimes you hit yeah. the, uh, hit every everything right and sometimes you're just messing around and making it worse, you know. That's, yeah. uh, well, that's just the nature of the game. A part of that fantasy for me, though, like when I listen back to some of my favorite albums in my youth that had the biggest inspiration on me, I always picked them you know this this tormenting process of sleepless nights in the studio where all these brilliant ideas are coming to this person and you know that's that was the romantic notion that i always you know pictured of artists and musicians in the studio doing things and i never really i never really fully got to experience that as a producer myself until i actually <laughs> sat down with luis and had to oh, sit through the torture of writing an album with him <laughs> Oh, no, funny. but I mean, you know, just the, the the process of like being awake for three days, you know, without sleeping or taking turns, taking turns sleeping. Like, you know, one person hits the couch uh, and sleeps for like six hours while the other person's working, but and then you wake you think, up. And uh, now, and now we're getting the now we're getting the real stories <laughs> behind the collaboration yeah. here. No, 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 but 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 then it isn't a struggle because you're enjoying it. Yeah, I mean it, it it's a struggle but it's a it's an enjoyable kind of cathartic experience in its own right. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you guys, you guys cuddled on the couch together. Uh, oh, more, than more than once. More than once. We don't, we don't want we don't want to come back to that to that to that that's where he broke my heart. <laughs> <laughs> I walked in on that one. Did you make each other <laughs> breakfast? 
Yes, I have actually. More than actually, time. Luis, Luis does make a good breakfast. Actually, though. actually, yeah, that is that is a thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this fool one time, not last time he was here, he dropped a glass pitcher for like lemonade and shit on oh, his yeah. foot at like yeah. five in the morning. Thing yeah. fucking broke and just hit him like, pssst, and instantly like. Pssst. So oh. I lacerated my foot, and it so was I even played like nurse for that shit. And uh, Luis crazy glued my foot back together. Yeah, that's so what actually, crazy glue was developed for in the first place. Oh, look at her! <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was insane, but it worked. So, dude, I've done that three times since. That's how how fucking. Oh, that's people cut them. Maybe you should get matter. a plastic pitcher instead. They should just get sharper shit. <laughs> well, it worked because I was doing the closing set at Bergheim like a few days later, oh, and I didn't, right. know how the hell, but... I didn't know how the hell I was going to be able to stand up for 10, 12, 12 hours. 13 hours, 12 with, hours actually. without yeah. getting without getting stitches on this like foot that was just bleeding, like spilling out blood. And then this dude's like, well, I got crazy glue. And I was like, fuck, <laughs> at this point, I'll, I'll try anything. <laughs> Well, it's not. Uh, it doesn't really matter if you use flu. If, if you lose fluids in uh, in in a place like that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah but he, 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 he had. He was actually leaning on. You had like a little bench or something you could lean on or something for hours. I mean. Yeah, they 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 able they were able to get me a chair, which I thought I was going to be sitting through the whole set, which would have sucked. But I ended up, I think, just through from the adrenaline of playing, I ended up just standing up, and I didn't even feel the pain anymore. So. Wow. Man, well, hardcore, see, dude. so th there is still some uh, some hardcore romantic artist uh, thing in you. Uh, you didn't <laughs> feel the pain during eight, <laughs> the twelve hours. The Just music, like the Olympics, the music got me through it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Limp his way through the, the to the what is it called the, the goal line. Well, if the legend is better than the real story, print the legend. Yeah, <laughs> legend is pretty good on this one. Yeah. So how how is the what's the status of the of the new project right now, guys? What uh, the um, belief defect thing? What status? What status? We need to finish two what's new tracks. What's the deadline? <laughs> uh, oh, good. That's actually we have to finish it within two months and hopefully fit in the schedule of the label because they were having their twenty fifth anniversary this year, but that shit wasn't going to happen. And w even when we thought it could, just uh problems started happening outside the music side like family side and the pandemic and all this shit so it inevitably got pushed so we're hopefully we can finish it soon before the summer's done yeah this year's presented a fucking ton of obstacles to have to dip in and out of to get this stuff done um i think a good chunk of the album's finished and i think one of the best things that i've done personally is not listen to any of it too much <laughs> because I'll tell you this much. Every time I do go back and I listen to what is 80% nearly finished, I'm really, really excited about it still. Like okay, I, I get good. pumped and I'm like, fuck, I mean, I can't wait to finish this. Yeah. And then, then mostly that's like, I can't wait to get back to Berlin because it's it's been a soulless experience trying to work with uh, on this online um, away from each other. And it doesn't feel the same as the first album when we were both in the uh -huh. same room. And suffering through it so um <laughs> yeah so i can't wait to get back and do that and my kid is calling me unstoppable <laughs> hey hey yeah hey, just go hey, go hey, man hey, hey yeah yeah it's near it's it's nearly two hours anyway maybe we can uh yeah. we can like we, we can we can uh make an end to it I, I was just interested in in um you know the the status of the project and what you what you learned from the first one what you did you did do differently this time you know apart from all the logistical differences but you know um a second a second attempt of you know a same collaboration always you know, you start off with the experience of the first one. So I was just, that was the last thing I really wanted to know, to be honest. You know, maybe Luis well, can talk. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, no, go, go. Okay. Um, to, I think, you know, go. there was, um, go ahead, Luis, because I got I to gotta stop <laughs> this issue. So, so, I mean, yeah, that, that's what I was trying to refer to before, as in this, this weirdness of setting a president and then living up to it somehow or well, however it is. So the um, 
the main thing I had issues with, Mo obviously has uh, his, his own set of, uh, of issues, was not to repeat everything. That was the main problem. And yet not become like a weird, different thing that has no reference, as in because it is the same idea. But uh, So when the whole technical side of making the drums the main thing, but not with the same process, which provided for different results, then that kind of started shaping the writing, which is still musical, just bring different elements together that are that still make sense and yet still shifts it into another idea more than just a continuation of the thing and uh and that thing I, that that part is done which i would guess that was the most difficult part so that's why i really when, when most tells me like dude the music is good and i'm not thinking about that it, instead of going like oh shit it's good it's it gives me anxiety because i want to fucking finish it then and mm. then you know so yeah i i, I do want to get it done because it just to finish it, you know. Mm -mm. Uh, but but the process hasn't been. And the creative side is not as difficult in the identity of the project side. It's more in the in the actual finishing the the writing part. I don't know if it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was gonna I was gonna say a similar thing to what Luis said about um, the process of writing this track being different than I mean, this album being different than the first one because of the tool sets. I think we limited ourselves to a specific set of tools for the first album, and I think those tools shaped the album to be what it is. Um, and this one, we switched it up and took a little a bit longer. Yeah. yeah, taking selecting a different set of tools, which presented some challenges and also presented some opportunities. And so, did you did you choose yeah. the different tools to because you wanted to to arrive at a different aesthetic, or was it? Yeah, 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 yeah. okay. If that was mainly the drums because that's what Mo is referring to, I think. Right. Is it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, because the first one, Luis had spent a ridiculous amount of time developing a particular reactor Some, ensemble which oh. was the foundation i still use it i still use yeah. it oh yeah oh cool yeah it was the foundation of the album but it does have its own texture and feeling to it and i think for this changing up that foundation gives the whole album a completely different feel uh, you know yep. so that that really kind of actually made things fun and I, I credit Luis to it mostly because you know I'm, I'm a I'm a slave to routine and I think mm -hmm. probably left up to my demises I probably would have continued what was working but Luis kind of was like no let's let's change this up and let's do this and maybe I was more resistant to it in the beginning but then it actually started to make sense and started to create some opportunities that I didn't see coming in the beginning that sounds like a good uh, um chemistry between the two of you you know keeping each other sharp and uh, kind of yeah, pushing each other and yeah that's cool that's really nice okay guys i you know i don't want to uh take more time of mo and and we're over two hours so usually we uh, we we um stop it we there. stick yeah we stop it there uh, uh unless uh, there's something on your minds like uh, anything you want to discuss you know, course, like this weekend no, no, yeah, we are going to do that. We're going to do like yeah, a, we're gonna everybody get like a, a round of uh, you know, plug-in gigs and, and um, <laughs> uh, well, no, I mean the main thing was uh, to give props to both of you on the left of my screen that uh, of the fucking live set they did that Mo was so fucking coy to promote because uh, <laughs> for some reason um, it was really uh, amazing, because, really amazing. Yeah, I think I think it was meaningful in more than the act in itself uh, because of everything that had to happen to make it happen you know you're Even talking you're pandemic. talking about this the stay at home yeah yeah, thing, yeah. Right? that one yeah. that one yeah, cool. so just uh chapeau for that because it actually was like the first thing generated out of the fucking pandemic that was meaningful regarding the context so chapeau for yeah that. and it, uh, that, i think that inspired a lot of people actually to see yeah. you guys working again and seeing the possibilities to be able to do this stuff uh, and that it, it was really, uh, really great yeah, I agree with Hiroko completely. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, slow clap for that. Thanks, man. Yeah, it was fun. It was really good. I mean, the the thing is that um, I, I, as we to talked about in the pre chat. Uh, with Mo, it was exactly the same as with everybody else, you know, like after we finished, it was like, ah, okay, so this is the phrasing of this other person <laughs> and, you know, mm -hmm. these are the sounds they come up with, you know, so it's like after these two hours, or most of the sets sets were two hours, it was like, uh, hmm, now we can 
You know, if we would have done another one straight after or a day after, it would have been, yeah. you know, we would have been sort of more adjusted and more sort of uh, yeah. tuned in. But uh, but at the same time, that was a charm, you know, just press start, see where we end up and, and just go for it. And so, yeah. it has a, uh, yeah. and for that, it was it was a really nice experience. Yeah, Mo came up with some uh, some really um, badass, uh, you know, percussion and, and basses and stuff. So, yeah, really cool. Anyway, thanks, man. Um, let's let's do this little round now where everybody gets to say what they're uh, going to do and want to promote or plug any gigs coming up, any releases, remixes. Hiroko, do you get anything? You want to share sure. anything with with um, yeah? Why not? The people uh, who are watching. So next month I've got a release on He She They with uh, my friend Justin Cudmore. Uh, pretty excited. Got a heartthrob remix on there. Pretty excited about that release. I uh, have some new stuff I'm working on with Submerge and some stuff with Hyperactive. Hopefully, we will get that stuff uh, on the table soon. And I uh, got some gigs. Uh, Saturday, I will be performing back to back with our friend Sophia Says in hey. Chicago. So, uh, if you are around, come hang out. And yeah, that's what I got going on right now. Awesome. Thanks, Yuriko. Uh, Thanks for being here. It was really good to see you again. And, so um, glad to hang out. Have fun in the weekend with uh, Sophia. Hiroko's also coming out to LA to play for us. Oh shit! Oh yeah, the Thursday, right? Next Thursday. Yeah. In a few weeks, so the third, yeah. the third Thursday of the month in August. So I don't uh, know how many list of viewers in LA are yeah, like watching three weeks, this month, more or less. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I'm going to be eating all the delicious food Los Angeles has to offer. So very excited <laughs> about that. Yeah. Nice one. Well, Mo, anything else then beside that party you got coming up? Anything you want to share? Uh, I mean, this weekend I'm playing the Great Beyond Festival in Minnesota uh, with Regis and Dustin Zahn and um, Truncate. Hyperactive. And, uh, Aurora Hillel and Hyperactive. I mean, the lineup is, mat is huge, so I can't even list them all. Um, doing that Saturday night and um, yeah, I got quite a few shows in san diego and stuff i'm sure anybody who goes to my social media can find it but other than that sorry to join in the conversation so late and thanks for having me guys i, I appreciate to be here even if it was just for a short time always good to see you man always yeah. always welcome always, always good to see you um so yeah thanks for for joining man uh louise anything you want to share i have a uh, there's a live thing on the third that will be posted somewhere uh as a i don't know if it's a live stream or something and uh with this um i don't want to fuck up the the, the credits so i'm just gonna <laughs> refer to my 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 media thing and uh some releases uh, a compilation is coming out of uh, arkham in, Bru in brussels there's some music there and we're finishing the album and uh, yeah i mean it'll be available wherever people get informed about this shit so yeah can't wait awesome. for that yeah um yeah also louise really good to see you man thanks for joining um, yeah, dude. i think the i have a couple of things to share one is uh, the stream that is still taking place that's the oscoot 15 year anniversary with uh, arte the channel in um in germany and Fr I, th I believe France. it's from France, yeah, yeah. It's France but they have a German uh, German uh, uh, department as well now. And um, the one, the set that I was involved in was with uh, Luke Slater and uh, Kamaru that has just been streamed, but uh, it should be online after this, after the live thing is over, that it should be available to, to rewatch. So that was, I was quite uh, um, uh, excited the way it looked, man. They, they made it look really nice. It was really nice. amazing. Yeah. That was such a beautiful stream. So that's there. And um, the other thing is that um, we are going to uh, uh, do a little hold, like uh, we're uh, taking a pause with Knob Twiddlers because we're doing something else at the moment. So we're doing a summer stop, basically. So this is the last one f before the summer stop. And uh, we were talking about this uh, Stay Home Sound System project. There were 40 episodes, and we're actually going to create um, a compilation uh, yeah, cool. of the the best uh, or not the best but uh, you know some of the good moments and it's an insane amount of material <laughs> to go through and that's why we also are going to help uh, get get help of the the people on on our discord community to help us go through all the material and find the best bits by posting youtube stamps and stuff like that so um 
yeah, that's going to be a project that uh, we're in going to take on for the next uh, couple of weeks. So, um, yeah. So uh, if you want to be involved in that, if you have any favorite moments of the um, of the any of the same stay home sound system sets, then uh, go to our Discord server. The link should be in the chat, I think, right now, and help us uh, creating this uh, epic document because that's going to be uh, a massive lineup and a pretty big. Do you have a name for it already? No, <laughs> oh, but it, we'll we'll post the details and and everything uh, to to Discord um, in the next few days, uh, so people can participate in uh, in um, you know assembling this thing. So that's, cool. that's it for now. That's all, that's that's all I've got. Uh, so thanks again, guys. Really nice to see you all. Uh, thanks, Hiroko. Have a good one in Thank the weekend. Thank you so much for having us back. I uh, can't wait to see you in person. Absolutely, same here. And uh, Mo, have a good one in the weekend as well. And uh, Luis, good to see you, man. And uh, yeah, all the good best uh, with finishing the album. I can't wait to hear it when it's done. Cool. So, yeah, that was it. Everybody in the chat, thanks for watching. And um, see you next time. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye. See you all soon.